Welcome to Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things Kiss. I want to rock and roll all night. Today's episode is brought to you by the book, Kiss My Black Ass. <laughs> okay, I think mine is better than your guys'. I just had to test that out. <laughs> this is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things Kiss. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Three sides of the coin this week. It looks like it's just the two of us, and pretty much it is. Tommy, yeah, Tom, two, Tommy, two made, Tommy, and Izzy. Good Lord, why is Izzy weaseling in? He just can't stay away from this show. He wants to be on so bad. No, he can't stay away from the Seven Elevens. Is what? Oh, Jesus! <laughs> they, they they make a guest appearance for a few minutes with our special guest. So for the most part, though, it's. It's it's the two brains of this show. Exactly. <laughs> Flying the brain solo. And the brain. <laughs> um, I was gonna say, Tommy, do you have any comments? But of course Tommy doesn't have any comments. He's barely prepared when he is here. That's true. So we'll skip the comments. Um I don't think there's any kiss news. Oh no, there is some kiss news. Mm-hmm. Paul Stanley had to cancel four Soul Station shows. Because he's still recovering from a concussion that he received skiing a few weeks ago. So, get well, Paul. Take it easy. Um, concussions are a nasty business. Any other kiss yeah. news that we missed? Ace is back on tour now. Yeah, Ace is. And, well, you know what? By the time this airs... Uh, Tommy and I are heading to uh, the Los Angeles Kiss Convention next week. I'm sure um, between our our special guest and I'm sure we'll have a few things to say about the L.A. Kiss Convention. I'm pretty excited to go. Um, can't wait, man. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, I already, I've already heard from a ton of people that are looking uh, uh, going to hook up with Tommy and I at the convention. So looking forward to seeing and uh, uh, some new making some new friends and putting some faces behind the name, so I'm pretty excited about that. Tonight, Tommy is spending the night with Izzy. <laughs> Just let that sink in, people. If you know Izzy, Tommy is spending the night with Izzy at his house. Yeah, they sent me a picture of his refrigerator. refrigerator. I went all over <laughs> having God. dinner at at Seven Eleven. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's just get into it. So this week, we've got a special guest joining us. The author of this book, Anthony X. The book is Kiss My Black Ass. This is my black kiss story. Um, we have a nearly two-hour conversation with Anthony. I'll be honest. When when I first we first got that book, I'm like, what is this going to what be? What is this about? Yeah, and that, let me tell you, shortly into it, my smile did not come off my face. I, I, I you know, it's funny if you're familiar, and I wasn't wasn't a big fan of the show, but Mike, I don't know if you ever caught the show, but the Everyone Hates Chris. You remember that old? Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Chris, uh, well, what the hell is the comedian's name? Um, Chris Rock. Yeah. That TV show he had for a little bit. I watched a couple episodes. I'm not a big TV guy, but there was times early in the book. That I if it, it, put it this way, if that TV show was kiss related, yeah, that would have been the early parts of the book. It was it was very. Let me tell you, this guy can tell a story. He's, oh, uh, he's great, a great, great memory recall. Listen, this is trust me when I say this. I can say this with with full confidence. Every single person who's a kiss fan listening to three sides of the coin, you can identify with at least one of the stories in this book because Anthony's a kiss fan and it's nothing but stories of being a kiss fan. And when we say kiss fan, we mean kiss fan with the capital K. I like, like a real kiss fan, a hardcore <laughs> kiss fan, a diehard kiss fan. Anthony's gone through things that some of us have never gone never. through, but you will be able to relate to what he's gone through because we've all gone through things for this band we love called kiss so please just let it roll and i'm going to tell you right now buy the book yep buy it it's worth the read it's fun it's you'll you'll love it you'll enjoy it 
great book, Kiss My Black Ass. This is my Black History by Anthony X. Let it roll. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. Mark's here. Tommy's in L.A. with Izzy right now. Hey, he can't see you. What do you guys doing the big face thing for? He's on the fucking phone. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, okay. So, so Tommy's on the phone. Mark's on the phone. Okay, Mike's on the phone. So we got all three. Of us. But Lisa's not here. Is that right? No, 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 oh, Lisa. Look at but... it. He's going right for fucking Lisa. What, Lisa? <laughs> we got, we got, we got Izzy. Is Izzy good enough? Does Izzy count? I don't even know who yeah. Izzy is, but how you doing, Izzy, and um, all that good stuff. <laughs> Uh, the guy no, who should be the bullpen, you mean? There's no, there's no Ooh. need to know Izzy. Ooh. Oh, that's all right. I want to see what she looks like, Tommy. Listen, okay, I, I'm rolling. We're recording already, we're guys. Doing, we're doing a podcast. My, oh, guy, and my man, guys want to say, look at that. Hi, oh. hey, everybody. How are you? Doing What's your name? Hey, rock my and name roll. Is Maria. This, is Mar- this is Maria. Hi, I'm hey, Maria. Church. I just met a girl named Maria. Are you, are you guys? Are you guys at the club right now or something? Is that what's going on? Yeah, Tom, Tommy and Izzy are outside of Seven Eleven. Yeah, picking I mean, up yeah. all the chicks. I don't. I don't know what the hell is happening. No, either do we. Either do we. No, I, I was um. Okay, so so I, I, I went to the A show yesterday. You know, we walked there in the cold, and uh, it was about twenty five minutes to walk there, twenty five minutes to walk back. It was freezing. The snow has been crazy out here in Flagstaff, and um. I took a bunch of NyQuil yesterday. I decided to just try to knock some of these flu symptoms that were creeping up on me. So now I'm drinking these Munsters because I'm trying to counter the NyQuil. And, um, you know, it's like when you drink these Munsters, you can feel your kidneys literally shutting down on you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, for, I might go into a coma in the middle of this interview. So if you don't hear my voice, that's what happened. <laughs> but no, I, I got to tell you guys something. Um, talking to Mark um, a few weeks back, Mark was a... Uh, because, you know, you get, you get the three sides Mark, and then you got Mark the, uh, you know, the, the regular person. He's the same person. I know all that. But, uh, and you got the swinger Mark. The, the swinger Mark, right. And um, he's just a down-to-earth customer. I mean, I got to tell you, he's a cool customer. I mean, talking to Mark for a few minutes on the phone, he was like, you're like the kind of guy, I mean, I, I don't drink, but I would go have a beer with you in a second. <laughs> go talk shit with you, you know what I'm saying? So, except when I'm with Izzy. <laughs> you know what it is, but no, Mark's a cool, you pretty cool dude, man. I gotta, I told my, I told my brother Mark that I said Mark's a pretty cool customer. He's a good guy. Cool. I, I tell you what, I love, I love the uh, relationship you have with your brother Mark. I, I throughout the book, that was really, really cool to, to, to you know, keep reading along with. So, so, yeah, so, know, so before we get too far down the road here, just so everyone knows, first of all, we are recording. Okay. And Tommy, you guys freeze up on us again. Oh, who cares? No, they're they're back. No, they're doing that so, snatch so, thing because he's we, trying to he's trying to be cool. Everybody, we, we lost you again. We, we, we are joined. Call mine. Call him. Call him. Call him. Hold on. I don't want to get... call Izzy. We are joined by the author of "Kiss My Black Ass," Anthony X. Oh, hello, Kiss fans. All right, so we lost Tommy and Izzy. Who cares about them? They're 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 having, they're they're having fun in L.A. at a Seven Eleven. We'll we'll continue the show without them. Yeah, boy, um, doesn't buy, that buy me a ticket, guys. If you if you listen to this. So 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 first of all, Anthony, where are you right now? You're not in Alaska. I'm in flat. No, Arizona. I'm in Flagstaff. I'm in Flagstaff, Arizona. Okay. Right now. All right, all right. All right. So, a little little background, I guess, for everybody who's 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 watching and listening. Um, this book is. Amazing! It's great. It's a great it. read. And and here's here's I'm going to give you my take on what this is. There's been plenty of books written about Gene and Paul and the band and behind the scenes and working with them and all the business and everything quote official related to Kiss. Right. This is like a book written about and by a Kiss fan. It's the life of a kiss fan that's all it is and you and you might not at first go well okay i'm a kiss fan what's so exciting about my life but i gotta tell you as i was reading every chapter in here i'm going oh my god he just described me he's described me (laughs) that was exactly what i was doing it was so cool to have a fan describe what it's like to be a kiss fan and write about it 
I love yeah, the and conversation. And, and that's exactly what, that's honestly that's exactly where I was going with it too. I mean, I mean, when I wrote the book, I wanted to I wanted to take the reader on a journey with me, and that was really what it was. I mean, I wanted to share my stories and my experiences. Um, I knew all Kiss fans could relate to because we're all Kiss fans. So while you were reading the book or a particular era, I wanted the reader to be able to reflect on like where they were or what they were doing during that era, like you just said. So because you know it seems like yesterday, but it was, it was really a long time ago, and. We all remember where we, were, where we were at the first time we saw Kiss Meets the Phantom or when we got our first solo album or, you know, we stood in line at our first Kiss concert or even saw the band for the first time, period. So um, I remember what those events meant to me, and that's why, you know, I wrote the book. And um, at the same time, I, w- I also wanted it to be a book that anybody could read. I mean, whether you're a diehard Kiss fan or a casual fan or not even a fan at all, I just wanted it to be a book that anyone could enjoy and, you know, get stuff out of. It was also an excuse to clean up my kiss attic. You know, that's what, that's what I call it, my kiss attic. Because it felt good to get all these stories out because they've just been in my head for years. And it got to the point to where I actually had to put a cap on the writing because I felt like I could I felt like I could, I could, could have just kept going on and on because all these memories just kept coming back to me. But um, when I started writing the book, I wanted, you know, I wrote it from the heart. So when it came to my experiences and my opinions, I just wanted to keep it real. I wanted to keep it honest and... I'm not one of those Kiss fans who wants to prove to you how smart I think I am or how much trivial knowledge I know about the band, because to me there's nothing more annoying than a Kiss fan who's always trying to prove to you how high his Kiss IQ is, <laughs> and there's a lot of them out there. I mean, to give you an example, I was on a Kiss page one time, and I was talking with, a, with, a, with fans about a... Um, we were talking about... Um, oh, there was the, the thread was Rock and Roll Over, and... Um, there was one Kiss fan, and um, I, now, I didn't say the record was bad. I didn't say it sucked. I just said I didn't really care for the album. I didn't really care for the production. But um, not the song. I didn't say the songs were bad. I just didn't really care for the production. And um, this Kiss fan, he hits me up on this thread, and he's like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, and you're not a real Kiss fan, and how can you say that about Rock and Roll Over? It's the greatest album ever. Fuck you, fuck you. And when of course, did Mike you know, apologize? We're in- <laughs> 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 Of course, well, of course, we're in different states, so I'm not going to be like, okay, well, meet me at Taco Bell on Fifth Street in ten minutes. We'll sort of just like men and all that bullshit. But uh, um, about an hour later, he he inboxes me, right? And I'm thinking, um, maybe he, maybe he's uh he's writing to apologize or say he was out of line or some whatever. So I open up the inbox, and as soon as I open up the inbox, fuck you, fuck you, you're not a real <laughs> kiss fan, and get the fuck out of here, you motherfucker, and and um. I finally had to write this guy back. I said, hey, hey, dog, check this out. Seriously, how old are you, man? <laughs> he goes, I'm 56 years old. And I'm like, you're 56 years old? I mean, you're like a grandpa, and, and, and you've got nothing going on in your life than to argue with a Kiss fan about them not liking Rock and Roll Over? You know, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Look It Up. Look It Up is my all-time favorite Kiss album. Asylum is my second favorite Kiss album, but um, I guess if you don't like Asylum, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. But, um... I don't know. Some of these Kiss fans, they act like um, Kiss is sending them checks to be Kiss fans or being a Kiss fan is their livelihood or something. Well, yeah, but, you know, um, I mean, you know, I, you know, we've said this before. I think a lot of it comes down to is some fans feel like you have to like everything the band has ever done if you're going to be a fan. That it's it's wrong to say I did not like something. And and I and I I just think that's wrong. You 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 can sit here and say I'm a huge Kiss fan. I will love the band forever, but some of the stuff they released was crap. Well, you know, yeah. what? I, I I thought in Anthony's book, and that's what I love so much about it was the casual conversation tone, and and what I mean by that is the passion just poured out. Just when, when how everything meant so much to you. I mean, from the beginning all the way through now and just and, you know, I'll let you explain some of your experiences. But my my absolute favorite part of the book, and and I can't wait till we get to this part of your conversation, is when you were you were going to get tickets for the revenge show. And I that just put a big smile on my face because, you know, at the time. You know, let's be fair. That tour wasn't doing the the, the greatest, and right. you know your your. I guess I'm trying to think of the, the most tactful way to say naivety or or uh, um, innocence. The innocence, I guess that would the innocence of oh my god, the place is going to be sold out. Oh my god, we got to get there. Oh my god, and you know. 
that yeah, story I mean, that story was worth the book well, she, well, alone. So, 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 Anthony, share share that story. Share your revenge ticket story with with everybody. Well, the thing the thing about revenge was my first Kiss concert, and um, I had never been to a Kiss concert, and I just thought that honestly, I really believe I was 18 years old, and um, I really believe that the only people who really got to go to Kiss concerts were people who were just blessed and lucky, because Kiss was like my world growing up, but I never had that. I mean, I'm from Anchorage, Alaska. We didn't get those kind of opportunities. Well, yeah, so. I was going to say, so everybody understands the backstory here, and we'll get into this. You grew up in, in Alaska, and Kiss right. has played Alaska two times. Twice. Right, once in 74 and um, in, in, in 2000, January of 2000. Yep. Yeah, I was, born, I was born and raised in Anchorage, Alaska. I've lived there for 36 years, and I know people have stereotypes and preconceived ideals that – Alaska is nothing but hunting and fishing and all that stuff. But I tell people like this: if you've been to Seattle, you've been to Anchorage, Alaska, because they're pretty much the same cities. I mean, they got the same neighborhoods, the same buildings, and blase. Um, people ask me all the time in the states: is it true that it stays dark for 24 hours a day, or is it 24 hours of sunlight? And I'm saying right here on three sides, I've never experienced that in all my 36 years. Not saying it doesn't exist, but you know. But um, one thing that is true is that moose and bears they will come up to your front door to borrow a cup of sugar. I mean, that's real. <laughs> My aunt, she came from Kansas one time, and um, she um, she went outside to get some out of the car, and then she came back in the house screaming at the top of her lungs. And when I went out to went out there to see what was going on, there was a big bull moose just eating off a tree in front of a car. And being from uh, being from uh, Kansas, she had never seen nothing like that before. And I totally understand because the first time I came to Arizona and I got a job, I came out to the parking lot one time. There was a big black snake just sitting there. And being from Alaska, I've never seen a snake out of a cage before. You know, it just was <laughs> weird to me. So I run back at my job, and I'm screaming like a little girl, ah, there's a snake, you know, call the police, call the fire department, call the military, you know. You know, my coworker, he goes out there with this box and this broom, and he kind of just sweeps it up and tosses it over the fence. And um, I'm like, you better take that motherfucker like 20 miles out of town and bury it deep in the woods somewhere. <laughs> I don't want no damn snake just close to my car. You just toss it over the woods. But anyway, getting back to the Alaska kiss thing. Um, yeah, um, again, being from Alaska – we didn't have those kiss opportunities like probably like you guys had. You know, you always kiss always came to town, or there was always some kiss event going on, and um, we just it just wasn't like that. Um, if something was old, you didn't really get your hands on it. Um, you didn't really get your hands on it. There wasn't like a lot of we had used record stores, but they just sold a few um, kiss posters and records and things like that. But um, one thing one thing one thing about kiss is when they played there in 74 it was at, it was at it was at the fireway theater parking lot and that was a drive-in theater back in the day when they played there it was a drive-in theater and so many times i'd walk through that parking lot but i never knew that was where kiss performed and i never knew i was walking on sacred ground if you will and um and when i finally found out that that was the parking lot where kiss performed i was trying to do all this research and i was trying to find out exactly where the stage was where the backstage was you know where the dress room i was trying to get all this research because i just wanted to just be on those spots you know but um, that was in 1974. Kiss didn't come back to Alaska until um, 2000, January 3rd, 2000. That was and, another um, great story. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, yeah. <laughs> but um, worst Kiss concert I've ever seen or ever experienced, you know. And um, I try to make the best of it, but um, you know, it and, 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 it, and it's funny because as I was reading that that chapter about the the 2000 show, I was there. I went to that show. I was still working for Kiss at the time, and and that was a show that they scheduled after the New Year's Eve show in Vancouver, and then they flew up to Anchorage to do the show. And I thought the show was awesome, and I loved it. I remember, because... I, and, I remember and I remember you said that on one, on, a, on, a, on another episode. You said a show that stuck out in your mind was the Anchorage Alaska yeah, show. Yeah, because it was a it was a bare bones Kiss show. It was basically just the band on stage with amps. It wasn't a huge production. But right. I, 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 call I, it can, a I, can, I can see where your view is different than mine because I'd seen Kiss every tour since 1983. So I'd seen the huge production, huge production, huge production. All of a sudden I saw this show and it was like, oh, this is like the early raw Kiss. But for you, you hadn't experienced that whole explosions of Kiss live in concert. So what you got in Alaska was like, Okay, this is not Kiss. This is not what. Well, let me say this. Go ahead. No, I was going to say it's just not what what it's been built up to be. Well, let me let me say this, Mike. Um, as a Kiss fan, I can distinguish the difference between um, um, I, from from the moment 
before, before Kiss even hit the stage, I knew it was going to be a C show. I, I was looking around, and I was looking at, you know, where's the flying rigs at? Where's this going to happen? Peter, obviously, Peter's drums is not going to levitate, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, I knew it was going to be a toned down show. And for me, it, was, it wasn't so much for me. I mean, like I said in the book, Kiss could have sat on stools, and I would have, I would have loved it because Kiss was there. Um, plus, I'm coming off the Revenge show. But for me, it was just, the, uh, the show was just, um, it was really toned down. It just wasn't an impressive show. But that were, really wasn't so much it. It was just the fact that musically, um, it was just really bad. Peter was, Peter was, was just playing too slow. Um, and that was really it. Peter was just playing way too slow. Um, I didn't think there was a, a, an up-tempo beat for the audience to get into. And, um, and, I, and I felt it the next day. I mean, um, you know, I've spoken to some of my coworkers. They just didn't like the show. Um, the people left comments on the radio. They were calling in and just saying how much the show was just really bad. And, um, yeah, it, I was just really embarrassed. Yeah, I mean, I could tell the audience wasn't into it at all. The audience looked really bored. And, um, but I'm a Kiss fan. Like I said, I'm a Kiss fan. Kiss can come out and sit on stools, and I'm still going to be impressed. I'm still going to love it because it's them. But it just it just left so much to be desired. And Well, and, you know, and I, and, I, and I think, you know, we've talked about this on the show, that the farewell tour was basically – you know that tour just revealed all of the the cracks and and everything that was going on internally in the band and right. and and that show in Alaska you know right or wrong it it just happened to be that was that was showing the the tension in the band the the lack of commitment the lack of wanting to give it their best and and by that i mean mainly um Peter and Ace, you know, Gene and Paul always try to give it their best, but when right. half the band won't live up to that same standards, it's hard to make everything look great. But, you know, that was that was the beginning of the end. I mean, by the time the farewell tour ended later in that year in, in the US, it was it was considerably even worse than what you saw in Alaska. Those last right. those last shows in the U.S. with with Peter and Ace, it was just like, oh my God! I mean, Mark, you've said this before. It was just like, there's there's it was an embarrassment. Yeah, and in, um, in Peter's defense, um, I, cause I'm not gonna say. I mean, in Peter's defense, I'd probably say that maybe that was that was the best he can do at that time, considering how old he was, his condition, his arms, and all that good stuff. I mean, I was open to all that stuff. Um, I was just saying as a fan, I I grew up my whole life. Kiss sucks. You, you suck because you're a Kiss fan. I, you know, I grew up around the whole life, so now Kiss comes to Alaska, and now they're just going to blow the roof off this place. And there's been a lot of other bands that have come through, but this is nothing compared to, to what Kiss is going to do. I mean, they're just going to steamroll Alaska. And that was kind of my attitude with friends and you know, all that good stuff. And when Kiss, when Kiss finally, um, it was time for, when, those, when it was time for the lights to go out and Kiss hit the stage, it just, everything just went downhill. <laughs> Right. I remember standing in the audience and going, this is really embarrassing. I mean, I'm just really embarrassed as a Kiss fan. Because it was just such a horrible show. The performance was just really horrible. And um, Ace, I remember thinking, why can't Ace just move around a little bit or make some facial expressions? He kind of just stood there. And um, the, uh, again, the Peter thing was probably the biggest of it all. He just was just playing too slow. And the audience, there was no up tempo beat for the audience to get into. And um, and you know, you know, and, and truth be told, there could have been thousands of people there that enjoyed the show and that loved it too. But for me, it was mostly just ego because, you know, I wanted to, the next day, yeah, I told you guys how great Kiss is. Yeah, I told you they're the greatest things to slice bread right, all that right, shit, you right. know, but it, it just embarrassed me personally. So that's my own hang up, not theirs, you know what I'm saying? But that, you know, what's funny, I, two things I want to talk about. Number one, that part, that chapter of the book that you just, you know, just just, just described, you did such a, a, man, I felt for you. I felt your emotion because you were telling your friends and everybody you could, man, they're they're here. I can't wait. This is great. And and after the show, I I felt your disappointment because, and as I've mentioned on the show before, I felt that way when I left the Columbus show, and I never felt that way about Kiss before. I I, I like felt like I'd been had. You know what I mean? And it bothered me. Right. And I didn't right. think they were doing their best. Uh, the other thing I want to uh, I really want to talk about, and it's something that you and I talked about privately. Another thing that I think makes this book so great, and I mean this, I don't see things through your eyes, meaning I didn't agree with you on a lot of stuff, but I respected your opinion, and I loved the, the passion that made your opinion come alive. And what we were joking about earlier, because I, 
honestly, Rock and Roll Over is my favorite studio record. I, right. I, I almost find it flawless. But when I was when I was reading the book and the way you were talking about it, it, it put a smile on my face. I'm like, because this is the great part about being a Kiss fan. No one person sees it the same way. But right. what I always try to do in my Kiss fandom is I want fans who got into the band later to understand why some things were as they were, especially, and, and we pick on it all the time, but especially something like The Elder. If you didn't know the shock of what that was when it, you know, during the proper timeline, meaning as it happened, you're just never going to understand that. You'll right. never get it because you went, hey, you know, I read all about this. It's this. And then you and you find it a true, you, you know, your true appreciation about it. But think about, you know, stuff like this from, you know, from 77 through, you know, 1981, you know, you got a couple pop records. They had, a, you know, a disco type single uh, and they had this, you know, this is, you know, concept album. And just, you know, like four years ago, you had, you know, Rocket Ride and All American Man. I mean, that was quite a departure. And right. if you look at it that way, and, and that's the way I look at it, only for the reason that that's how I, I lived it. I can't look at it through someone else's eyes. It it honestly doesn't make sense through someone else's eyes, just like maybe my experiences don't, you know, uh, in your eyes. But I always have the thing I go back to, but, I, you know, I was there from the beginning. So that's how come I feel a certain way. And I love when I, I read a book like yours where – it's a total fresh take on it. It's totally different. World's different. And another thing, too, I grew up in Detroit. I still live here, obviously. Kiss was king, man. Kiss was everything. Right. And right. you didn't miss anything. Matter of fact, the newspaper just didn't, you know, they would write articles about them. You'd see Kiss all the freaking time. And to not to mention Cream Magazine was based here, too. And Cream was really, really supportive of the band. Right. And and they were on the radio, and Kiss was a huge, huge deal here. So again, you know, where you're like, you're, you know, you're scraping by just to get a hit parader, you know, with an article, exactly. a picture of Kiss. <laughs> you know, I've got all these, you know, all these other magazines and newspapers and radio, and I mean, we were pretty spoiled Kiss wise here. So you know, <laughs> Mark, Mark, I, 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 I want, I agree with that. You hit the nail on the head. This is a I didn't read the book through Anthony's eyes, but I felt what Anthony was feeling, if that makes sense. Because as a KISS fan, we all had these same types of feelings. Maybe not about Rock and Roll Over, but about a different album. Maybe not about the Revenge Tour or the Alaska show, but it was a different show or a different tour. And and the book did such a great job of, of me bringing me back to a point where I was like, yeah, I remember feeling that way at this point in my KISS fandom around this right. album or this magazine. And, and, and to me, that's, that was just what was so amazing about this is it wasn't just one story and one feeling, but it was, it was you know, from the very first moment you first discovered KISS all the <clears throat> way through your entire life, I don't know if I could remember all of my kiss stories and all of my kiss feelings and all my kiss yeah. experiences. You got you you were fortunate that you wrote everything down here and it was just like my god, I'm reliving it again. I'm feeling it again. And and so much of it like Mark said was it's related to timeline. If you didn't live through it or experience that, it may not mean as much to you. Um cuz I you know Anthony and I ch chatted about this earlier this week. He's like me about the Unmasked album. There's somebody else here. Anthony is just like me that they still suck on the Unmasked album. When I read right. that chapter in here, I'm like, oh, my God, there's another Kiss fan. He felt exactly like I, he was describing my feelings of what it was like to see that. And then, Mark, as you explained, if you weren't there in the 80s, to experience the people picking on you and hating on you for like and kiss, it doesn't mean anything in 2017 that it says they still suck. <laughs> 
But trust right, right. me, back in the 80s when that said that, it was like, oh, my God, how do I defend my own band when they say they suck on their album cover and I've got three friends in high school telling me they suck? Right, right. And, and, and also something to keep in mind was, and I always try to keep this in mind, that um, like, like Mark is always saying timeline, and, and age, age line is the same, same difference because I'm 43. You know, you guys are probably a little bit older than me. Um, and when I'm Mark 52, says he loves, I'm like, a grandpa. Rock, I'm 50. Well, there, there it is. You were probably that you were probably that guy on Facebook that was cussing me out. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. But, but but I'll say this. Um, when Mark says he loves rock and roll over, and sometimes, like I said in the book, I don't get it. But um, I, I tell you like this. Um, you came from a different era of kids because me, when I was seven years old, the elder was just the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, oh, I love this album. I'm playing it a hundred times a day. I get I get out of school. I play it. I wake up in the morning. I play it. But if I was 16, a 17-year-old Kiss fan, I probably would have felt different about it. I'd probably say, wait, this, this, this doesn't sound like rock and roll over. This doesn't sound like harder than hell. What's going on here? Are they, they selling out? What are these guys doing? Maybe I'll start listening to Iron Maiden or whatever else was out at the time. But um, at seven years old, I mean, you didn't know anything. Kiss could do no wrong. Well, you know, Anthony, and I, I've told the story on the show before. Um, when the elder, when I, because I've got from Love Gun on, I've gotten every Kiss album the day it was released. So I bought music from the elder the day it was released. I went after school and got it. And I, I called my friend with the oath still blaring in the background because I just heard the opening riff, ran right. to the phone, called my buddy going, they're back because I wasn't happy with Dynasty or, or Unmasked. Just, right. you know, it wasn't, you know, hard and heavy. And keep in mind, at the time, I was listening to a lot of Van Halen, a lot of Ted Nugent, that sort of thing. So, I, my, the next day in school, my buddy's like, man, you know, how's the rest of your record? I'm like, uh, uh, don't even, don't even waste your time. You know, it, because, like you said, that, that opening salvo, that opening riff, man, off of, uh, off of the oath. And then really, for the most part, there's nothing else like it on the record. So I was expecting once, you know, once the oath was over, I thought the rest of the record was going to sound similar. Obviously, you know, not every song was going to rip like that, but right. And it was just like such a dis. And by the time I got to the end, and I remember sitting in the middle of like Mr. Blackwell going, "When is this? Don't, don't." Do I mean, really? <laughs> hey, also, too. I never to said I was more than I. <laughs> no, no, to be fair, at that time I was already playing in a in my high school band. I was already playing, right. drums, and I was going just. In my meager, you know, youth going, bomb, bomb. I'm, I'm like, there's nothing to the song. It just it just bothered me. And it, I just remember being very, very disenchanted with the whole thing. And I got to admit, I still am to some degree. Um, I, I've come to like the record a lot, and I, I enjoy it. It just isn't, you know, that's not the, the my go-to. But, but, but you can <laughs> like it in 2017 after you've had – all these year, forty years to to live with it and listen to it, but when that came out that year, left field, man. It was field. okay. It's better than no kiss, but Jesus Christ, what kind of kiss is this? Um, I, honestly, I, I didn't. I was never really disappointed with the Kiss album until Sonic Boom. I can't say I was thrilled about um. Psycho Circus, but hey, it was a new Kiss album, and at that point, I thought it was all the real, the real Kiss members playing on that album, and I was like, you know, hey, it's a, it's a new Kiss album, I'll learn to love it, if there's some things I don't like about it, it's a little soft in the ass, but I'll learn to love it, but it wasn't until Sonic Boom came out that it was my first disappointing Kiss experience, and I always said, if I was 13 or 14 when Sonic Boom came out, I probably would have loved it to death and played it a hundred times a day, but um, I was too, by that point, I was too old for that, I was too old to be hearing stories about, um, too hot, too cold, and all that stuff, and it was just—it was just too cheesy. I grew up on Creatures of the Night. I grew up on Lick It Up. I grew up on Asylum, and you know, destroyed everything. So don't don't feed me a steak dinner, you know, ten years ago, and then today give me a TV dinner. There's a difference in this, and um, you know, I, I, just I, didn't I, 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 you know, I get you, Anthony, because I think I commented a while ago about that myself with Sonic Boom. It was it was a little odd hearing. 50, 60 year old men singing songs about groupies when I know they're right. happily married with children. And it was right. just like, okay, it... you're, that's not real. That's not real. You're just writing that for an, a song. I want, I want 
I want the song to be real, and that wasn't. It just felt fake. Felt like, okay, right, we're exactly. Kiss, we're rock stars, I need to write about a groupie. But I haven't had a groupie in 30 years. And, 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 I, and, I, definitely didn't, and I definitely didn't want a 70s throwback album. That was my, my biggest complaint. Um, and I always say this, I don't care who writes the songs, I don't care who plays what, I don't, I don't care if there's ghost musicians or ghost writers, just give me a great Kiss album. I don't care if Gene played bass only on two songs and the rest was, uh, they brought um, Bruce in to play bass, I don't care. I just want a good Kiss album, something I can play and just enjoy. Um, to me, right now, as in 2017, to me, what would make a great Kiss album would be something between a cross between, uh, I'd say, Crazy Nights, The Elder, and um, Carnival of Souls. Look at the time. Oh, boy. <laughs> Anthony, it's been great having you on the show. Those match. I know, right? I just probably... <laughs> some, some uh... like, I was going to buy his book, but I don't think I'm going to buy the book now. <laughs> but, you know, those, those albums are just like... Cause to me, they were a little bit more mature. You know, and I think as a Kiss fan, I want a little bit more mature albums, more evolved albums, I should say. And um, to me, Sonic Boom and Monster, they just don't do that for me. Now, I know, I know what I said about the Monster in the book, but um, I recently purchased Monster, and I've been giving it a, you know, a listen. And um, I think I've narrowed it down to the first six songs are pretty listenable, pretty decent, good songs, you know, but um, I'm just still not sold on it. Um, Did you get the bonus track, not- the right here, right now bonus track? Um, that's how little it means to me that I don't even know if there's a bonus. There's 12 songs on there. <laughs> so so you there, know, there, I, there, there was there. You, and you, you can probably go find this song. Just watch it on YouTube. It was the bonus track for iTunes purchases. It was a song called Right Here, Right Now. And I'm just telling you as a Kiss fan, and, and I think we've got some similar styles in what we like in Kiss. Um, I felt right here, right now was the best Kiss song Kiss has released in a long, long time. It felt the most like a Kiss tune that I've heard in years, years. So Year. go look for it on YouTube. I do. I just wrote that down right here, right now. Um, I think for me, I, you know, I love, I love, all, I, I love all flavors of Kiss music. I really do. I just, I love the different flavors and um. And um, I don't need I don't need Kiss to be a hard rock band for me to love them, because um, if if every if every Kiss song if every Kiss album was just a hard rock album with just loud guitars and drums, I'd be bored with it. I really would. So I need Peter's Peter's 1978 album. I need the Dynasty album. I need Animal Eyes. I, you know, I need Creatures, and I, I need all of that. As a Kiss fan, I love all these different variations. You know, I need Just a Boy just as much as I need Danger. I need Love's a Deadly Weapon just as much as I need uh. Why don't, uh, Man of a Thousand Faces, you know, I need all these different colors in Kiss's music, and that's what I love about the band, because all of the different backgrounds show up on these albums, and, um, I mean, for me, Kiss has always been more than just a band, I mean, they're a major part of my life, and it'd be hard for me to imagine my life without Kiss in it somehow, so, I don't mean that in an in idolized sense, but, because you, you should only idolize Jesus, yeah, no, or whatever no, I you mean, believe I think, in. I think that's part of the, 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 the cool part of your book, is that comes across, but that's something... As as a diehard Kiss fan, I could totally relate to that. It it it, it wasn't crazy. It wasn't strange. It wasn't odd. It was like, hey, here's here's another Kiss fan just like me, and he's telling his story about how this band was so important to his life. I mean, here's a story I'd love to have you share. Talk about this what you went through to um, hear the Asylum album. Oh wow, yeah. <laughs> That um, I just remember um the Asylum album. I just remember uh, the first time I saw that album at the store, and um, I, I, I mean, I was one of those those Kiss fans as a kid that that just stared at album covers, and I used to walk them out of the store just to look at the Asylum album because I couldn't I didn't have the money I couldn't get the money at the time to buy it. And um, now let, let me let me I ask you remember, right there, how does that feel? How did that feel as a huge diehard Kiss fan that you were standing there looking at something that had new Kiss music on it and you couldn't hear it? Um, I felt like, first of all, I felt like the album was mine. I'd stand in the store and I would hold the album in my hand. I felt like it was mine. I didn't have no money and I knew I wasn't going to walk out the store with it, but it was still my album. Then I would sit there and I would read these songs and all I would do in my head was try to imagine what these songs sounded like. <laughs> you know, um, gee, what is Trial by Fire? Is that like a, a hard rock? Is it like really fast and up-tempo? Is Eric getting busy on the drums? You know, is Bruce doing a fast solo? What's going on, you know? And that's all I could do was just stare at this, this album and try to figure out what these songs sounded like. And um, I'd walk to the store pretty much every day just to make sure the album was still there. And I remember that heartbreaking feeling when I went to the store that one day and the album was gone. 
and um, as, as as obsessed as I was, I always felt like if there was something in Kiss in the store, like if there was an item, if there was one left, that was the only copy in the world that existed. <laughs> and um, I didn't, I didn't, um, I just remember um, going to a friend's house, and um, when I got to hear it on the radio that night, I just remember feeling like blessed. <laughs> Like I, I honestly felt like I honestly felt like God played that just for me that night on the radio because He knew what it meant to me that I really wanted to hear this new Kiss album and um, it was just an obsession. I just can't really describe it. It was just an obsession. And um, Kiss, I would I would literally shake and hyperventilate when I would find something new of Kiss, you know, especially a new album. It was just like it was the most exciting feeling. I, I didn't care about nothing else. Um, it was just if I got a new Kiss album. Everything else ceased to exist until I got, until I got that album all as I was. Um, I mean, you and you you've experienced that feeling. I described this one. It's happened to me once, of walking into a record store and looking at Kiss albums and going, "Oh my God, what is that? I've never seen that cover before. I've never heard of that album." And discovering that there's a new Kiss album. You've just you've had that happen to you a, a few times, right? Oh uh, yeah, a few times. And um, I mean that's that's an amazing to me. That's when, when you I know, you, in, people, I had the, people might laugh at that, but that's an amazing feeling. I, that happened to me for Creatures of the Night, where I walked into a record store and I looked on the wall, and there was Creatures of the Night staring at me, and I'm like, "What is this?" I had no clue anything was coming. It was like the greatest gift in the world was just discovered, and and I still remember that feeling today. I mean, it's a, it, that's one of the things when I listen to Creatures of the Night, it brings me back to that. So I can only imagine the excitement you felt over and over when you've discovered these albums. Right, and um, and I still remember the I still remember the same feeling I had when when um I went to Robert Joe's, which was a used record store in Anchorage, and um they had a copy of Alive, a used copy of Alive, but it had the the exception was because I already owned Alive, but it had the booklet in there, you know, with the pictures and everything, and um. I just honestly, that was probably the most magic I ever felt for a Kiss album, or wanting to possess a Kiss album when I pulled those, those, that booklet out because I had never seen that before, you know. And um, I remember just staring at that like this is the most magical thing in the world. And that's, I guess that was the only way I can describe it, which is magical. Um, for me, it was like I just had to possess. I just had to possess this thing. I just had to possess Kiss stuff, you know. And um, I, I mean. I went to bed at night staring at all my Kiss magazines and my Kiss records. You know, I'd, I'd take my albums to school every day, not just to play them because I could play them, but just so I could have them close to me. Everything was about Kiss. That, so, that's something. Oh, really quick, I wanted to, that's something I wanted to to add. You literally carried your records with you to school for no other reason than just to have them with me. I mean, that I, was when it. I just read to have that. I'm me. like, there's no way that guy did it, but he did. Oh my! Again, uh, that just uh, my jaw dropped when I was reading that. Um, yeah, I just, wow, yeah, <laughs> that, um, I mean, like, was you just, scared that, like, your brother was going to sell them on you, or your parents are going to throw, I mean, you oh, no, 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 not at all, it was just, I had to have Kiss close to me, I mean, I just, I really had to have Kiss, that was, I loved looking at Kiss, I mean, that's really what it was, I just loved looking at these guys, um, I didn't care if they had makeup, I didn't care if they didn't have makeup, I just wanted to look at Kiss, I wanted to be close to Kiss, and, um, I mean, Kiss was really just a major, they were just a major part of my life. Um, it was just, um, it's kind of hard to explain, but... Um, well, I don't know if it's hard. I don't know if it's hard to explain, because remember, you're talking, the majority of our listeners are going to be pretty diehard Kiss fans, and, and, and we may not have taken Kiss records to school, but we've I'll put done, it like this. When we've I'm done out, other when, whenever I'm at, whenever, whenever I'm at a Kiss event, sometimes I wonder... Did you see? Did, okay, I was at the Ace Frehley concert yesterday. You know what was going through my mind? Because Mark and me were just standing there, right? We're sitting there watching the Ace show, and I'm sitting there going, "I wonder if these Kiss fans, yeah, they got Kiss shirts on, some people even got makeup on, you know, they got the Ace Frehley makeup on, etc." But I wonder if these people look at Kiss the way Mark and me do. You know what I'm saying? So I always wonder about that. Not that I'm more of a fan or I'm less of a fan. Not in that sense, but in the sense of what it means to me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm so much. I mean, I'm, I, Kiss is so much a part of my life that I, I have Kiss Tourette syndrome. <laughs> which is actually a real thing. <laughs> I mean, I could be standing at a bank, literally at a bank, and for no reason at all, I'll sit there uh, yell out, she's a vision in leather, like salt on the wound. <laughs> I mean, I'll do some shit. Or I'll say some shit like, I got a question for the wild people over here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
And the security guard would be like, uh, yeah, I got to go over here singing kiss songs to himself. I'm going to need backup. Better bring the dogs. <laughs> you know, that shit. But that's just how it is. That kiss to red syndrome is real. It's just part of my everyday thinking. It's part of my everyday psyche, you know. It's just, it's, it's always just kiss. There's not a, an hour of the day that doesn't go by that, that I don't sing a kiss song on my head or I don't do a kiss, Eric Carr, or Peter Chris drum roll, you know, or something, or, or, or Bruce Killick or Ace Guitar or Lick, you know. There's just always something kiss going on in my mind because it's just that much a part of my life. At the same time, I wouldn't say that I was obsessive. Um, again, I don't idolize the band. I don't idolize the members. Um, it's just a part of my life. And I think, uh, you know, my brother Mark said it best. He said, uh, Kiss is like our other family. Like, you don't talk to them on the phone. You don't see them on a personal level. You don't send them Christmas cards on the holiday or nothing like that. But at the end of the day, they're still your other family because you've just been so emotionally invested into it for so many years. And that's just what it is. I mean, my brother Mark, I mean, I mean, I mean, I think sometimes, I think sometimes he's more fanatical than I am. He's more like a groupie. <laughs> I remember um, we were um, we were at the A show yesterday, and Richie Scarlet walked by, and Mark was like, "Do you know who that is? That's Richie Scarlet." He got really excited, right? And I looked at him. I said, "Who's Richie Scarlet?" <laughs> 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 I could tell you about Kiss, but but their solo bands, their members. I don't, you know, Mark really gets into that kind of, you know, who the who the members are and the other bands and all that good stuff. But um. But um, your guys' experience is probably a little bit different than mine at the same time because at the same time, I didn't grow up listening to rock music because rock music just wasn't my thing. Um, I mean, I didn't go to rock concerts. I, I didn't buy rock albums. Um, I got my limited knowledge of rock was like uh, watching groups on MTV like the White Snakes, the Motley Crues, the Scorpions, the Millie Vanillies, and blah blah blah. But you would think because I was a Kiss fan, I would have naturally gravitated towards other rock groups, but it just wasn't the case because. If it wasn't Kiss, I didn't care. Rock, rock music didn't appeal to me. It didn't have nothing I wanted out of it. For me, it was always about hip-hop, rap, R&B. But um, Kiss was a whole different thing. Kiss was just, Kiss wasn't a rock band. They were just the greatest thing in the world, is bottom line. Oh, they just happened to play rock music and put out rock albums, you know. But they were just the greatest thing in the world to me. So, um, I, 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 mean, I, I love... That was I love the classic thing. rock station, of course. I mean, I love those old songs they play because they bring back great memories and blah, blah, blah. But I was just saying rock just wasn't my thing, but it was always about Kiss. Kiss first. Kiss was more than a band. They were a major part of my life, and um, I put nothing before Kiss growing up, you know? Well, that was one thing I wanted to, you know, I, I'm glad you brought it up because I was going to, that was my next question was, I just thought it kind of, I guess bizarre, if you want to look at it that way, that you didn't gravitate towards a Motley Crue who, you know, in some ways, especially in the 80s, I mean, because because musically in the 80s, Kiss did a lot of, uh, oh, how do you say, trend following. And so you could look at a song like um, Hide Your Heart and then you could also go, well, I could hear Bon Jovi doing that. You know what I mean? Or you could, wasn't Paul Stanley, and that was the difference. <laughs> you know, but but you you see what I'm talking about. There are similarities. Both right, I know, I, I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Um, That's, I mean, so you know, I just found it hard when I was reading your book, and I was like, wow, he he just didn't. Did you know that they were kind of playing trend following, or did you even understand? Not at all. It? Not at all. Because it. If Kiss put out an album, if they had the Kiss logo on there and the members, you know, that was it. I didn't. Because I didn't know enough about rock to say, okay, Kiss was doing this or they were they were doing that, or you know, um, it just wasn't like that. I could look back now to look at up pictures and say, oh yeah, Paul obviously had the same designer as David Lee Roth for the Jump video and the Jump era, 1984 era, and all that stuff. But at the time, I was just a kid, and um, it was just I never looked at like I didn't follow rock. I didn't know enough about rock. Sometimes what I would do because you know I was I was obsess obsessively buying rock magazines because um, Kiss was in them, of course, so. When I got done reading the Kiss article, or looking at the Kiss pictures, sometimes I'd flip and read a little story about a. Uh, I don't know why this sticks out to me. I remember reading a story about Jackie Lee. Um, I think Jackie he's a guitar Lee? player or something like that. Yeah. From Ozzy that, always, that always sticks out to me because I remember just for some reason reading his story. You know, maybe I was sitting on the toilet when I was young. I don't know. I was doing something. I just sat there and read his story. But that's the only thing that, that really sticks out to me. I remember the um, what do you call it? Um, I remember thinking the Looks to Kill video was really cool, you know what I'm saying? I always thought that was a cool video. It looked fun. I was like nine years old. And um, of course, because they were the bastard kids of Kiss, and that, they, they looked kind of cool. But I didn't want to go out and buy their albums. I didn't want to wear their T-shirts and something like that. You're not Kiss. <laughs> and sometimes even that weirds me out, because sometimes you have some fans that are like, um, I'm a Kiss fan. I'm a big Kiss, rock fan. I'm a big Kiss fan, but I also love the Scorpions, and I love Judas Priest, and I love this. And That's that was always weird to me, because I'm like, 
How can you say you love Kiss but equally love other bands? I mean, for me, because for me, it was always just Kiss. I didn't put no one next to Kiss or beside Kiss. Kiss was always at the top of everything. And um, But after Kiss, you know, after my love for Kiss, that what goes down the list would be second, Ohio Players, Cameo, Slave, Army, because I'm a big R&B fanatic, 70s R&B fanatic. Um, I will say this, though. Um, speaking of the 80s, um, I, you know, I always say I love 70s Kiss, but I'm in love with 80s Kiss albums. Let me correct that. I love 70s Kiss albums, but I'm in love with 70s Kiss albums. Because to me, the 80s, they were always, to me, the albums are more sonically better. And overall, I like the songs better. I'm a huge fan of Eric Carr and his drumming style. But to me, the 80s just had more energy. To kind of give you an example, um, um, as a rapper, part of being a rapper, you know, we're always having to jog all the time because you've got to keep up with your breathing because you're always spitting so many lyrics and words. So um, I started noticing a trend. I love to listen to Kiss music when I jog. So I started noticing a trend. Whenever I would play 70s Kiss albums, um, I would always jog a little bit slower, and I would go shorter distances. But then I started noticing when I would play 80s albums, I would jog faster and go an extra two to three miles. I mean, just something about Lick It Up, Animal Lights, Crazy Nights, and all those albums, they just, they're good workout albums to me. They just have that energy. And um, one of the reasons I wasn't fully on board as a Kiss fan with uh, Kiss reuniting in 96 was because... Um, I knew once they did that, the music was going to change, and it did, you know, because I haven't been happy with Kiss's music really since the Carnival of Souls and Revenge era. And um, I never, I, not once as a Kiss fan did I ever say, oh, I wish they'd bring Peter and Eric back, I mean, I'm sorry, Peter and Ace back, because I didn't really want it. I mean, I love what they did in the 70s and what they contributed to in the 70s and the early 80s, what Ace did in the early 80s, blah, blah. But um, I just didn't want them back. I, I, wanted, I wanted that 80s sound. I wanted that Eric Carr, Eric Singer sound, that Bruce Killick sound. And um, I haven't we haven't had it in a long time, so oh, we're never going to um, have it again, right? And um, I, and, and don't get me wrong, like I said, I don't I don't bash the seventies by any means, like that. I'm just more of a fan of the eighties. Um, it uh, the eighties Kiss albums appeal more to the adult in me. Um, as an adult, I always say with all Kiss uh, with all Kiss lead guitar players, I always say Ace really has the best feel. I mean, he's got the best feel. I mean, it's a, it's a lazy kind of style, and it's just awesome. Only Ace is just Ace. But um, but as I get older, I still want to. I want to hear Bruce Kill. Like, I want to hear Vinnie Vincent. You know what I'm saying? And um, I want to hear Eric Carr's drumming. You know, I want to hear uh, I want to hear uh, Animalize and Asylum. I just I love those albums. I need those albums daily. You know, and um, and I, I know now we got Tommy Eric. You know, Tommy and uh, Eric Singer doing the makeup thing. I don't really have a problem with that either. Um, I think at some point we're all guilty of saying uh, certain bands aren't as good with original members. I'm sorry, without original members or with certain members. And it's not because it's true. It's just, um, we just, we just created relationships, you know, with older members. So we always, we always try to hold on to the past, I guess. But I got no problem with, uh, Tommy and Eric, um, Tommy and Eric Singer doing the makeup thing and all that good stuff. It just doesn't bother me. It doesn't phase me at all. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, growing up, I always thought, um, Guns N' Roses, I always thought the original Guns N' Roses or the real Guns N' Roses was the, uh, Appetite for Destruction era. I mean, to me, that's who Guns N' Roses was. That was who the band is. Nothing's ever going to beat that, you know. Um, mind you, I wasn't a follower of the band, but um, that's who they were. I've seen some of their old live footage, and to me, they were always boring on stage, but that's who Guns N' Roses is, Appetite for Destruction. So, But let's fast forward now to, say, uh, um, a couple years ago. I was walking down the street in Vegas, and I saw this billboard, and it had Axl Rose with the, with the new band, and... Um, I don't know if it was for a concert or if it was for a new album, but I always remember I used the word pathetic. And, um, I said, this is so pathetic. I mean, look at Guns N' Roses. I mean, look at Axel. This is pathetic. Why is he trying to – he's ruining the name. He's ruining the band's image. This new band is just pathetic. It sucks. It's stupid. He needs to retire this band and let it go. So now let's fast forward again to um, – let's fast forward to uh, two months ago. I was channel surfing, and it said, uh, coming up next, Guns N' Roses Live. And I don't know why, but I was kind of curious to see what it would look like. And so I left it on there. And um, the, sh the concert was about two and a half, well, about two and a half hours long on TV and, um, I was with commercials, of course. And I remember um, thinking when it was over, well, actually while watching it, I remember thinking, this is awesome. This is, a, this is great. I mean, this, this new band is great. I mean, the visuals and the musicianship and the energy, it'd be great. To, I remember thinking it'd be great to actually be at that show. And this is the new band. And... Um, I guess a lot of people, what do you call it? Um, I guess 
I wouldn't. I would have never known how good this new band was unless I gave it a chance. And I think you have a lot of Kiss fans who, or even casual fans who, don't give the new Kiss, the Tommy Thayer and the Eric Singer version a chance because you, you, you kind of hold on to the past. Oh, that's not the original Kiss and blah blah blah. But um, I think if you just, if you know, you give it a chance, you, you'd, you'd probably love it. And um, I know there's some Kiss fans out there who've actually um, who've seen the new Tommy Thayer and Eric Singer and don't like it. But I think overall. If you just give it a chance, I think you'll love it, and that's great. But I guess the point I was making was, in all my decades of being a Kiss fan, I've never had that attitude that the original Kiss was Gene, Paul, Peter, and Ace. I've just never had that perspective at all. I mean, to me, it was wh- whoever was in the band at that moment, giving their blood, sweat, and tears, that's who Kiss is. And I remember growing up as a kid, every time Kiss got a new member, whether it was uh, Vinny, Mark, you know, uh, Eric, Bruce, I remember how excited I was because there was someone new in Kiss. And it always made me want to find out who is this person, what's their backstory, what are they like, you know? Are they going to sing on the new album? You know, what, what, are they, you know, are they really good? What's it going to be? I remember eight, being, eight, I remember being eighteen years old and uh, <laughs> opening up a rock magazine and seeing Eric Singer for the first time, and I was just really excited because his hair was blonde, <laughs> and that was it. He had blonde hair, and that just really excited me. And I, you know, I, it's, I, it's, I, I, I remember that during the Revenge era, it was like. Uh, it was like, oh my God, Kiss has somebody with blonde hair in the band. That's the first it was time different. that has ever happened. Right. And um, yeah, which it was really exciting. There's just something about these these um, back back then I should say it was just something really exciting. I mean, now when you know when I saw Tommy Thayer, I'm like, oh, whatever. Someone's new playing for Ace. I'm a little bit older now. It doesn't have that same mystique to me. But <laughs> yeah, it was just growing up in that era being a Kiss fan. That's just what it was. Yeah, I, I I can I can relate to that. I mean, I you know I was first introduced to Kiss in '76, but I think I really got deeply into Kiss during the '80s. I mean, that's when my connection to them got really solidified. And and just like you, I didn't care what was being released. If there was a new Kiss ca- album coming out, I was buying it because it was a Kiss album. And right. and Kiss was something that was bigger than the musicians in the band to me. So I didn't, right. again, I didn't, okay, a new guitar player, new guitar player, new drummer, doesn't matter. Kiss is still here. Kiss the band. Right. You know, when 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 I, the first time I saw Kiss was the Creatures of the Night Tour. That was only 50% of the original band. I just remember thinking to myself, my God, I am in the same building as Kiss. <coughs> Kiss. Kiss is exactly. right there. That's them. They're moving on stage. They are moving in the same <laughs> air space that I am moving in. They drove on the same roads to get to this building that I drive on. You know, and that's exactly it, what it was, yes. Yes, it was a bigger than, oh, my God, it has to be this guy or this guy. No, it is Kiss. It is this, it is thing, it is this thing that is so much bigger. And, and that's why when people are like, well, when Gene and Paul leave, Will Kiss survive? Will you give it a shot? And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm definitely going to give it a try. I will right. give it a try because if the new people who come in have the same kick ass charisma and attitude, charisma and, 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 attitude, feel. yeah, all of that that Gene and Paul the spirit, have, the spirit, yeah, if the feeling is there, and I walk out going, God, that just kicked me in the ass. That was awesome. Right, I love it. But, you know, I'm not going to write it off without seeing it and giving it a shot. Because, again, yeah, Kiss is I, – I think that's what I loved about your book is it, it really showed that feeling of how Kiss was more than just another band. It just they, – they weren't Motley Crue. They weren't Rat. They weren't Twisted Sister. They were not just another band. Right. And, um, yeah, honestly, I was really happy to – I mean – when, I mean, when I finished this book, I was just really, really happy. It just felt really good to, to get all this out, and um, I felt like I remember actually feeling like um, I don't know if it, I don't I wouldn't call it ego or even pride. I just think there was a sense of if I die tomorrow, I'm a part of the Kiss world now in some way, shape, or form, and you know this means a lot to me. And it was more than that. This means a lot to me since, and um, I spent close to six grand writing this book, and um, I was happy to do it. I mean, there's other things I could have spent that money on, but I was happy to do it because it was it was Kiss, and it was for Kiss for the KISS fans and the KISS Army and all that good stuff. And um, um, I spent close to four years writing it, and um, 
I had no problem with it because I can I couldn't see myself doing something for four years like that <laughs> unless I was really passionate about it. But I think you know I'm gonna die a passionate Kiss fan, and that's just what it is, and that's just why I was just so happy to put this book out. And um, and when I hear comments like people like you who say you like it, because you don't know how people are gonna respond. Even, you know, no matter how much you write from the heart, you never know how how much someone's gonna like something. And um, it's always humbling when you hear Kiss fans like yourself say, "Yeah, you like the book, and this is this is what you got out of it." You know, and that's always a great feeling. It makes well, you feel like you did something right. <laughs> Go ahead, Anthony. I- Michael, I'll tell you this, because I was the first one to start reading the book. I started reading it, and I sent Mike a message, and I'm like, Mike, did you start? And he's like, all right, I'm going to start. I'm like, dude, this is really, really cool. It's so unique. So just to let you know, it's genuine. Now, as like, you know, since you're a fan of the show, there's been other times we IM'd each other about books we weren't crazy about. <laughs> <laughs> but this was genuine. I'm like, I said right away, I'm like, Mike, we got to get this guy on the show. <laughs> and uh, he's like, yeah, yeah, cause you're cause that because let's let's let, you know let's uh, a little inside baseball. Anthony, I got to hold you what a couple it was a couple months ago, right? I guess it was, was it? I guess so, huh? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was. Uh, I don't so, know why I was thinking a few weeks ago, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it was actually a couple months ago. So because we had to you know work around your work schedule and everything, and you know this is when you because you went to the A show and you you know you had to get everything scheduled. So just to let the people know how genuine it, it really was for, you know, uh, Michael, Tommy and I and how much we honestly enjoyed your book. It was so again. And this is the, the part I think is cool. I disagree with you on so many kiss issues, but I love it because right. that's what being a music fan is all all about. I mean, hearing other people's takes on things. And uh, again, the stories are fantastic. Um I love the relationship you had with your folks. I love the fact that they, much like me, this is this is something we had in common. Your parents seemed to dig that you dug this, and they were happy to see you happy. And I, I thought that was cool. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times my dad has taken me somewhere and bought me a Kiss album or or, or even a magazine with Kiss on the cover, and you know we'd be standing in line for him to pay for it and. <laughs> He would just look down at me. He could just see the he could see the big cheese on my face. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I my dad would just and, and that's the great thing I think about you know I, I'm a parent, and whenever my kids I saw whether I understood it or not, I remember my son when he was younger he was into like Power Rangers and stuff, and I didn't get any of that, but right. I saw the joy it brought to him. You know what I mean? Right. I saw, and I'm like, hey, my mom and dad were like, hey, if this makes him happy. I want my kid happy. And, um, and you know, so kiss was always something that, you know, it was just, my parents didn't get it or understand it, but they knew it made, made me happy. And, and again, cause throughout the book, you know, how many times you had to, you know, your, your mom and dad also like mine did too. They kind of used it as leverage for things too. Right, <laughs> hey, go clean right. your room and, uh, you know, maybe we'll, uh, we'll go get that kiss record or poster or something. Right. Also, I want you to tell me, cause you don't really talk about your sister a whole lot, but I love the, the story about what one of her <clears throat> friends, or was that the asylum album? Was that the, was that the, what was the one you had to go in and kind of do some reconnaissance? Oh, that was the, uh, I think you might be talking about the Rock and Roll Over album, and that was when that's, the, um... Why don't you share that story? That's, that's a good one. Yeah, that was the, um, I was at, um, well, I was at my friend's house, Sean, and, um, his, uh, his, his, uh, sister, they had their friends, she had their friends over in the bedroom, you know, it was kind of like that 70s show, everybody was hanging out in their bedroom, and, um, I just remember being in there, and I was just kind of just hanging out a little bit, just trying to fit in where I, you know, get in where I fit in, and his sister took out the Rock and Roll Over album, and I remember just, um, just it was the first time I'd ever seen this rock and roll over album. And I just remember just, you know that feeling you get when you first see a Kiss album, and it's just like, nah, you know, that little, yep, with yep. that uh, that music that goes off, of sudden that little sound that goes off in your head, that alarm. But um, I just remember she showed it to her boyfriend, and he blew it off like it was a cheap TV guide or something like that, and she just put it back under her bed, and um, I just had to just sneak in there, and uh, well, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. I um. We had they had a barbecue a few days later, too long, not too long after, and um, I said I had to use the bathroom. Nobody was in the house. I knew it was my time, so I went in that I went into that bedroom, their, their his sister's bedroom, and I tore it apart and I found that damn rock and roll over album. And I remember it like it was yesterday, just sitting on the floor cross-legged and just looking at this rock and roll over album. 
It had the Kiss logo. It had Kiss's faces. I don't know what the album sounds like, but I'm a little kid. And it's just the most magical thing in the world, just to stare at, just to stare at this album. And that was just it. Um, Kiss albums, to me, were just... Um, they were, they were just, again, there was just something amazing about these albums. Um, I remember how, I mean, when I got into Kiss, when I, when I got into Kiss for the first time, my sister had a friend that stayed the night with us. And um, so she, she stayed the night. Um, I've, always, I've always been fascinated with the album covers. My dad had a big jazz, blues, R&B collection. And um, so when she stayed the night, my mom took them to get ice cream. And so I snuck in, her friend had brought some records over, so I, I snuck into my sister's room, of course, started looking through her friend's records, and I saw this album, and it had four weirdos on there. I mean, they had this this face paint, and these weird outfits, and these high heel boots, and there was smoke on the album cover. Well, of course, it was alive, and I remember just staring at this thing, you know, intrigued. So I stole the album, you know, I took the album, put it under my mattress, <laughs> and Every day I would just go in my room when nobody was around and just take the album out and just stare at it. Because, again, that obsession was staring at album covers, but Kiss was just something else, a whole, a whole other stratosphere. But one day I went up to my mom and I said, Mom, can you play this for me? I, I was four years old. I remember this like it was yesterday. And she never asked me where I got the album or where it came from. She just put it on the turntable and walked out of the room. And to this day I can still remember um, hearing Deuce for the first time and I was staring at the album, the live album cover at the same time, and... At four years old, I didn't know what obsessive, obsessive was or what obsession meant, but I knew this was going to be my new thing at that age. <laughs> that I was never, I don't think I even knew the band was called Kiss, or I couldn't read at the time, but I just knew this was going to be my new thing. And um, I've, never, I've never looked back, you know, because of, because of where I grew up. I, you know, I was the only Kiss fanatic that I knew, because growing up in Anchorage, you didn't have a lot of Kiss fanatics, you know, beside my brother Mark, of course. And for the people around me, not only, I mean, like, friends and classmates and blah, 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 but not only was I the only KISS fanatic, fanatic that they knew, but I was the only black KISS fanatic that, that they knew. I mean, I, I, never, I never met black KISS fans before. We didn't exist. And well, because I was a black KISS fan, I, I mean, to to well, Go ahead. Well, I was say, because I was a black KISS fan, people really looked at me like there was something wrong with me. I mean, people looked at me like being a black KISS fan was like the equivalent of the kid who eats his burgers in class or some shit like that. <laughs> Even into my late teenage years, I, I still got I still got the funny looks, and it was just really weird for a lot of people that I was a black guy who liked Kiss. And once I got, one sister I know, I, I, I'll, I'll say this: one sister I know, she um she put it to me like this. I was having a conversation with a friend um a few years back, and she said, "Uh, people didn't think you were weird because you were a black guy who liked rock music, because you know a lot of brothers and sisters they like white music, they like rock music. It's not a big deal. But people thought I was weird because I was a black guy who liked Kiss." And Kiss was just considered weird to everybody in general, you know. But go ahead. Oh well, it's it, the, the, you. When I first started reading your book, because my my older brother had a, a friend who was a black guy, and he was probably the biggest Kiss fan I knew, and I just thought it was weird. You know what I mean? Because you're right; you didn't see a lot of black guys at the Kiss shows. I went to all the Kiss shows, but right. the, one of the guys that I knew, and keep in mind, this is this is in '79. My brother's uh, – uh, it was actually somebody my brother knew. He was friends with them. But, I mean, I remember we'd trade Kiss pictures, you know, and he was two years older than me. So right. you know, he was 16. I was 14 in 79. And, but, boy, we connected on Kiss, man. You know what I mean? Was, and I just thought that was cool. You know what I mean? Because – the and that's to this day. The love of Kiss has no boundaries, man. It's it's uh, it's It's incredible. And one thing, and this is really like a podcast for one, because I know my 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 buddy Howard listens. We lost a dear friend who was a, a I used to call him BBD, Big Black Dave. Uh, right. Good friend of mine, probably one of the biggest Kiss fans I ever knew. Um, again, black guy, and it was just so. When you go to the shows now, though, it's a pretty diverse crowd. You know what I mean? Um, I'll, tell, I'll tell you what really surprised me. When I went to the Kiss, the opening of the Kiss Mini Golf Course in Vegas, um, now, mind you, just to get in and just to be a part of that, participate, the, the, the VIP, VIP passes were $500. And um, I was surprised myself when I saw a lot of brothers and sisters out there wearing VIP passes. I mean, a lot. When I say a lot, maybe about 25, 30. And, um, it, it surprised me, you know, um, coming from Alaska, of course, you know, I was, I came to Vegas in 2010. I've traveled and lived, you know, you know, a few times in other states and cities and blah, blah, blah. But, um, um, 
sometimes even I got to come out of that little, you know, that little box, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, it's unique being a black Kiss fan in some places, but, you know, it's a big world out there, you know what I'm saying? And it's not always as small as you think it is. So, I mean... I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that. I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah, because I feel the same way, you know what I mean? We pe- that's the great thing about music in general. I mean, it's it's music. It should put a smile on your face. You know what I mean? Right. And, and, and whatever works for you. You know. You know. If, if you don't like the, I mean, if you don't like the cheeseburger off the menu, then order. I don't know, order a salad or something. There's always Amen, something for right. everybody. Amen. Exactly. Exactly. That's it, it nailed it. A- Anthony, we got to ask you this question. Go ahead. I already know it. <laughs> <laughs> Did Vinny Vincent save Kiss? Did Vinny save Kiss? Um, I think the only thing Vinny Vincent saved Kiss from was having to spend a lot of money on expensive hotel rooms for him. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, wasn't he, wasn't he like living in, staying at the Motel Sixes when Gina Paul were in the penthouse suite this week or something like that? <laughs> well, that's that's what his claim is. That's what he says. And, and, and Gene was like, don't worry about it, Vinny. There's a soda machine down the hall. You got air conditioning and HBO, and there's a McDonald's across the street if you get hungry. <laughs> no, nah, I don't uh, – did Vinny save Kiss? No, Vinny didn't save Kiss at all. I mean, even though um, Lick It Up is is one of your favorite albums. Oh, I love Lick It Up. I love the cover. I love the way Vinny looks on the cover. I think he looks awesome. Even even though it's a wig, he still looks cool to me. I I always thought Vinny Vinny fit visually into the band with and without makeup. I thought he just fit into that that early '80s you know heavy metal thing that they just had going on. The hardcore thing they had going on. I think he, he was perfect. I love Vinny. Um, I love Vinny the character. You know the person. I mean, if I saw him walking on the street, I wouldn't even ask him for an autograph personally. Um, but anyway, get, to get back, no, I don't think Vinny saved Kiss at all. Um, I always, I always, I always say Heaven's on Fire is what saved Kiss. Um, I think Lick It Up was a great album. It wasn't, it wasn't as superior as Creatures of the Night, but it was a great album. And um, um, but I think, I think it's just common sense just dictates that um, it was them taking off the makeup is why that album sold a little bit more. Um, yeah, but if you don't have here's see, here's where here's where the disagreement fan in me comes out. If you don't have lick it up, meaning you don't have the goods, regardless if they took the makeup off or the makeup, whatever, the the people who heard the song on the radio liked it. And my point is you don't have that lead in um, for Heaven's on Fire. I I don't think Heaven's on Fire is a hit. Lick it up made it all possible, which ergo Vinny wrote the song. Vinny, Vinny wrote eight of the ten songs on there. Vinny saved Kiss. I believe That's, that uh, Kiss taking off the makeup is what saved them. And um, if they didn't take yes, off the makeup, I don't, I don't, I don't. They had to have the goods though too. Yeah, you couldn't just. Kiss, Kiss has had a lot of albums with the goods on them that didn't go nowhere. Really, creatures of I mean, the night. Creatures, you're right. Creatures, not, was, creatures had the goods. I mean, you know, and, and, and in some respects, the Elder had the, had some goods on there too. Um, I mean, Peter's solo album had some good. I mean, Peter's 1978 solo album had a lot of goods on there. I mean, there's, there's, there's some great ballads on there, you know, that could have really been big songs, really good pop songs. That just, the album didn't go nowhere. Anthony, um, I'm, not dis- I'm not disagreeing with you, Anthony. What I'm saying is once you take, once the faces are exposed, they had to have the goods. Meaning it wasn't enough for the music to sell just taking the, the makeup off. People came around to the way we think rather than, you know, us coming around to the way they, they thought. Because we as KISS fans knew the goods were there all along. It yeah, wasn't but, um, until, it wasn't until say, go, ahead. go ahead. Well, I, I was gonna say I'm sorry I don't mean to interrupt, I do that sometimes, but um, um my <laughs> com- commercially, I mean again, commercially I don't think I don't think the album was good commercially in, in the sense of the songs were there. Because you got I mean, I always say there was a lot of powerhouse songs coming out in 82 83 and 84 i mean a lot of them i mean you, you had come on feel the noise you had photographed by def leppard um just a lot of great songs on the radio and um, honestly i don't think the song the single itself lick it up was really a great single for the band i think it was pretty weak i love it because it's a, it was a kiss song and it was when they took the makeup off and blah 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 but i still think it's a weak single coming from kiss i mean if they would have got with a mutt lang or a i don't know whoever else was popular at that time i think they could have came up with a better sing some better singles for those albums um, um, again, I mean, I've, I've analyzed that back and forth, you know, et cetera. But to me, it always comes down to one thing. Um, them taking off the makeup in 83 is what, um, is what saved that album. If they didn't take that makeup off, um, it just, it, the album, I think that's the only thing that sold those records was them taking off the makeup. I think the tour kind of speaks for itself. I think if that, um, I think if that were really true, that tour would have did so much better and it just didn't, um, 
they came out in 84 with Heaven's on Fire. It was just a great pop rock song. Uh, it was catchy, and Paul was just singing happily. All, it, was just, it, just, it just had everything. All of a sudden, you can hear you know, people are driving down the streets blasting Heaven's on Fire out of their car. It was just that song. Was, I remember that song was being everywhere. I couldn't get away from the damn song. And, um, and I remember being mad because like, now all of a sudden, everybody wants to claim my band again because now they've got a hit song on the radio and blah, blah. But I guess I always go back to Heaven's on Fire is what saved Kiss, you know? Kiss taking off the makeup might have saved Lick It Up, the album itself, but I don't think it saved Kiss in that sense. I can understand. I can, under, I can understand what you're saying because as you were, as I was reading what you were saying in the book, I remember back to that point as well. And the thing that I noticed between Lick It Up and Heaven's on Fire was Lick It Up there wasn't a lot of advance excitement for Lick It Up. It was after the fact, meaning once they took the makeup off and, and the word kind of started getting around, oh, my God, Kiss took the makeup off. Let me go listen to this new song. Oh, it's a good song. But right. Heaven, Heaven's on Fire was the first time that I remember as a fan going, I'm hearing the radio station talking about we're going to debut this new single from Kiss in two weeks on Friday at 3 p.m., tune in and listen to it and i never remembered that as a kiss fan happening before where people were now in advance excited and hyping that this new kiss song was coming out and i remember staying up listening to my local um, kq metal show and taping their debut of heavens on fire because this was the first they made a big ordeal out of it. It's the first time we're playing the new Kiss song, Heaven's on Fire from the soon to be released. So I, I kind of get what you're saying there because it felt like Animal Eyes took what started with Lick It Up, but it really exploded. And Heaven's on Fire right. was, even though you did see Lick It Up on MTV every once in a while, you saw Heaven's on Fire all the time. Right. And, and, and I'll say this, um, because Mark, Mark is gonna, Mark is definitely gonna have a different perspective because he's older than me, so his surroundings are a little bit different than mine. But I just remember as a kid, the first time I saw the Look It Up video, being excited because I was seeing Kiss for the first, well, not, not for the first time, but I was just seeing Kiss in a music video for the first time without makeup, and that was really exciting for me. But I don't, I wasn't excited about the song, of course, but I do specifically remember being at being at our friend's house and watching the Heavens on Fire video for the first time, and I remember just thinking. This is going to be a big song. I mean, I'm a kid, but I know this is going to be a big song. It was just a catchy song, but um, I guess that's not the original question. The original question was going back to Vinny. Um, Vinny is a phenomenal songwriter. He's a phenomenal guitar player. Um, but having heard these albums, Look It Up being my favorite album again of all time, um, I don't see anything that he did on that album that could have been done. I mean... Yeah, yeah, it had superior writing. I mean, the the, the, lead, the lead guitar playing was just, they could have got anyone to play those licks. Paul probably could have played those lead guitar parts. Well, you know that on Exciter, that's not him. That's Rick Derringer. Yeah, I know there's like different players, but I was just saying in general. But um, Well, that's I'll, my I'll say, point. Without without the song, it doesn't matter who's playing the song. And that's why, again, Vinny... But, I, but, but you know, we can, all, that, we, can um, all, we can always make the argument, too. We never know factually exactly how much... Vinny contributed to all these songs that he's listed as a co-writer on. You know, there's never but been I, an... I, but I'll say a, this. We, we've never anal, analysts the best that we do. <laughs> <laughs> How You know, nobody has ever come out and said, well, this song that Vinny's a co-writer on, he wrote more than just one lyric, or did he write the whole song? And Gene... There's no way to know. There's, there's no, no way, way to, to know. There, right. Yeah, it's possible. Right, right. And it, it, it would only come out if the songwriters themselves revealed it. So at the end of the day, there's always that huge unknown. How much did Gene write versus how much did Vinny write? How much did Paul write versus how but much did Vinny write? That's you want to get really geeky about this. That's why collecting demos is so important. Because sure, you can you can start piecing together. You can start piecing together the songs that became songs on Lick It Up off of Vinny's demos. So he had those ideas. He had a lot of those song structures well in advance. But I'll, I'll say this. It's not a written rule that uh, good songwriting automatically means you're going to sell albums. Oh, no, and, not um, at all. Well, you're absolutely I mean, right. Because, right. because, 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 because um, the, the, I mean, Lick It Up, is, songwriting-wise, is, was way more superior than Animal Eyes. But um, bottom line is, Animal Eyes, the tour, and the album, 
did better than Creatures and Lick It Up, the albums and those tours. So, I mean, the proof is just in the pudding, I guess, is all I can say. I mean, Heaven's on Fire, that's what I say when I, when I go back and I say Heaven's on Fire is what saved Kiss. Um, I think the, ticket, the, the, the tickets and the album sales just kind of speak for themselves. I'm not saying that the, the ticket sales dramatically went up, but there was a difference in those ticket sales. And, um, and I, I can only go by my own timeline where I say um, people who weren't KISS fans or just casual KISS fans, all of a sudden were just excited about KISS again. All of a sudden I'm seeing people wearing KISS T-shirts, you know, the Animal Eyes um, um, T-shirt. And um, people are just, I'm hearing this song everywhere. People are just blasting the song out of their radios. Um, that's just what it was for me. But that, that's, that, you know, I, I never say my way, my way of thinking is right. You know, it's just my perspective and my experience. You know, there's always going to be another perspective. And when people like Mark, when Mark, when you say stuff like that, I definitely think about it. You know what I'm saying? I definitely reflect on it and say, okay, well, maybe he's got a point on this or he's got a point on that. You know what I'm saying? So, well, I, Again, that's what I loved about your book, what I said earlier. I, I totally appreciate that we see things totally different because our experiences were totally different. Right. That's a big part of it, too. Anthony, let me... Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me ask you, last week we did a, an episode where we did a roundtable of rewriting history, what each of us on the show would do to change, if we could rewrite anything, no rules. Let me give you the chance to do that. You know, as a KISS fan, as the big KISS fan you are, if you could rewrite anything in KISS history, change it, what would you change? I'd take our rock and roll over and destroy that demo. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! Look at oh the my time. God! Man, it's, it's getting late. You're killing I'd me. I take Eddie Kramer in the woods with that with the master tape and put a bullet in it. No, I'm joking. Oh my God! <laughs> oh, oh, I feel what like what would I rewrite in history? What would I rewrite in history? Uh, let me see here. <laughs> um, honestly, for me, when it comes to Kiss, um, beside the presence and the spirit of the band, um, I'm always about the albums. You know what I'm saying? So. If I could just rewrite one thing, I would just take the albums that I'm not fan of, fans of, because it's, I, don't, I never say the songs are bad. I always just say the recordings are bad. I would just, I would just want better produced albums. That's it. You, you take Harder Than Hell and Rock and Roll Over, leave the songs there, but just produce them better, make them sound sonically better, and that'd be it. You know, um, that would really be it. I don't have a problem with the changes of the members. I don't have a problem with the different phases. I love the different phases they went through. Um, it'd really just be about the albums. That that's it. Change the make make the album sound better. Make a lot of those seventy albums sound better. Make Love Gun sound sonically better. Leave all the songs. I got no problem with the songs. Just make them sound sonically better. You know, if if I always say this, if all the songs, uh, if all the seventies albums, like Rock and Roll Over and Love Gun, you know, if, if they could sound like Side Four of Alive Two, that'd be perfect for me. If if Kiss goes in and records another album now, who would you want them to use as a producer? Anybody but Paul Stanley, obviously. Um, I, I always say Paul's not hungry anymore, so I don't think Paul is capable of delivering the goods. But um, as a producer, honestly, I, I don't know who's who's who today. Um, I, could, I could obviously sit there and say, oh, the Rick Rubens and the Mutt Lanes and all that stuff and the Bob Rocks and blah, blah. But I don't know what they've done lately. I don't know if they've lost their touch, you know. So I honestly really can't say. But I will say this. Um, if I had if I had my choice of KISS producers – either Bob Ezrin or uh, um, Michael James Jackson. Um, I don't, and when I just because I say Bob Ezrin, that doesn't mean I want a revenge part two because I don't want a revenge part two at all. Um, I just want a more of a... I just want I just, I just like more of a sophisticated album, that's all. I, I, I like the way so, that Bob Ezrin will craft songs. He, he, paints, he paints a nice sonic picture with music. Right. Right, and um, I remember I remember reading that in the Elder book how they were talking about um, I believe it was his assistant that was talking about the way he puts music together, et cetera. But um, yeah, I just you know just just a good album, you know, um, Michael Michael James Jackson or um, Bob Ezrin. Probably I'd probably be pushing you know towards Bob Ezrin a little bit more, and um, because I think the reason I say that because again I want more evolved Kiss music. I want more of a sophisticated sound. I want an album that says okay we've grown up now. We're not talking about our our cocks anymore and all that tired shit. You know, or Paul's always talking about um, um, fucking um, believing yourself and all that weird shit, and <laughs> say yeah. I don't want to hear that crap. Um, just want a sophisticated album. That's all. 
I don't want to well, talk. I don't want songs about Delilah, spaceships. You just, you just described. You just described modern day Delilah to a T. I described a mature song. It's a great rock. See, because I love Sonic Boom, and when you're talking about, you know, what's a no. No. Mark's getting his dinner order. No, I already had dinner. <laughs> this was made a, a dynamite dinner. Um, no, she's checking me in for my flight for tomorrow. Um, anyways, what I was saying is you the the critiques you had on Sonic Boom described the lead off song. I mean, the things that you want in a kiss song. Don't you agree that that modern day Delilah is a m- more mature rock song? Um the song is the overall song. If I if I play Modern Day Delilah now, it sounds like a. It just sounds like a garage band to me. Honestly, I like the song. I like that. I like that rhythm riff. You know that's in there. Um, but um, this is not what I want from Kiss in 2016, 17, or 18. You know, it's just not what I want from them. That's 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 kind of really what I'm saying. Um, I will I, stack I those two songs, Modern Day Delilah and. Um, I'll give you a perfect Hollywood example. I, I would say. Uh, they did in the 80s. <laughs> And let's, post, let's, hold on, post lick it up. Anything they did from Animalized to Hot in the Shade, those two songs are better than anything they did on the, on the, the next few records. In my opinion. Well, now we're, getting, now we're getting into preference and opinions and things like that. But I'll give you an example. When I say Evolve, um, when, I, when, when, I think of a, when I think of a song like It Never Ends off of Carnival of Souls, yeah, great Souls to, me, to me that's a great Paul Evolve song to me. Or when I think of a... Um, I, I will be I there. I'm happy that you had uh, um, Carnival, of Sub, uh, Carnival of Souls love, because I do too. I like the record a lot. Definitely. And when I think of I Will Be There, to me that sounds like a Paul song that's evolved. You know what I'm saying? He's not talking about, when he's saying I Will Be There, he's not talking about some damn chick. You know what I'm saying? He's just talking about his relationship with his son. And um, it's just it's just an evolved song. To me, Reason to Live is, is an evolved ballad. You know what I'm saying? It's just a good evolved ballad to me. The sound of it, the feel of it, and... um. Just a boy, the Odyssey. They're, they're just evolved songs. I would like to see kids do more of that nowadays. I just can't. I just can't buy into the whole. When I listen to Monster, or even Carnival. I mean, Monster and um, Sonic um, Boom. um, Sonic Boom. I can't. I can't buy into it. You know what I'm saying? I can't buy into it. it to me, it'd be like a. It, it'd be like fucking um. It'd be like a kind of like Rocky movies. You know, you see Rocky getting older, it's like, okay, I can't buy into this no more. When I was a kid, it was great to see him knock out Mr. T in the Russian. But now I'm, I'm, I'm 43 years old. I don't need to see your old ass trying to punch out the guy. I, you know, certain things don't, don't appeal to you as you get older, you know what I'm saying? That's kind of what I'm saying. I, again, I, I, I can draw the, specifically on those two songs. I think those two songs could have been on early Kiss records. Um, I think they're head and shoulders more like the traditional kiss sound or the sound that i fell in love with more so than than you know what came out in the 80s again where they were clearly trying to follow other bands successes um whereas in the early days they were marching to their own drummer and i believe they're marching to their own drummer now i never never believed that as a kiss fan i never believed even even starting from the first album i've never believed that kiss their sound was just their sound i mean i think everything comes from something no, no, whether you admit true. it or not, that's and um, true. and I think some of these Kiss fans get caught up in what the real Kiss sound is or what this and that. I always, I, I always say this: Kiss fans, when they talk about the real Kiss sound, they're just talking about the sound they like best, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But um, Kiss just, uh, I just, I just, they, I think, I think since the first album, Kiss has always been following something, and some to some degree or another. Some albums were just more out there than others, but they were always following something, always trying to find some kind of way. Well, and um, being influenced by something, and then. T- following a formula are two different things because I think Hide Your Heart is a formulatic song. It, that is that is meant to, that was written to be a single. They tried very hard to get that to to be a single the way it was written. And that's why they brought in people like Holly Knight along the way and stuff like that. In the early days, it was just them. And again, I you know, that's the sound that, Kiss Alive is everything. If I had to give up one person, if I had to give anybody ask me, well, why do you love Kiss? And you can only give them one record. To me, it'd be Kiss Alive. Because it, 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 it's just, it's sonically, everything about that record, you can hear how genuine it was. And, and that record, you can hear how desperate they were. I mean, they, they were hungry. I, I, you know, and, and I think going back to 
uh, especially something like Modern Day Delilah. It has that it has that hunger to me. I, I I really think Paul was really proud of the band, how what the band had become, and and again, I love I love that record stem to stern. I love every song on it, and and I think he accomplished that in my opinion. And again, you know you know what Anthony, that's what we're here for. You know what uh, we're three you know, guys you know, and, 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 But that's the thing that that word hunger. In my opinion, that's what I can't buy on Sonic Boom and Monster. I can't buy that these guys got that hunger back. Oh, and I disagree. Because, because they're freaking multi-hundred millionaires living luxurious <laughs> lives in Beverly Hills. They don't have the same hunger they did when they were recording Kiss and Hotter Than Hell and Dressed to Kill. It's, I it's, think it's they had... They 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 I will never they have that hunger. They will they never some... ever have hunger like that again. Ever. They had so some... Let me say this, guys. Let me interrupt you to say this because first of all, I, w- I want to give props to what Mark said earlier when he said um, there's a difference between um, being influenced by something and just following something, and that, that's a that's a damn good point. That's a really good point. So I give you a lot of props on that one, definitely. And something else I want to add is, I think sometimes Kiss fans. Here's what I see. And this is my perspective. You guys grew up around Kiss fans. I didn't grow up around Kiss fans. But from, but from my from my little window, it always seems like to me that Kiss fans are always trying to put something there because they like something. So they're always trying to put a mindset. In other words, they're trying to say this was the mindset that Kiss was in when they recorded Dress to Kill or Heart of the Hell. This is what they were doing. They were just so hungry and passionate. I never bought into that at all. I've never felt that way. I never – well, they were hungry when they did Heart of the Hell because if you listen to the songs, and I like the song so much, if you listen to Strange Ways, Ace was really just digging deep for this song. To me, I've never interpreted it like that. To me, these are just songs they went to the studio and they recorded. Some sounded better than others. Some turned out better than others. And to me, that was it. But I don't try to put more emphasis on these albums or these songs just because they were, say, 70s albums. I just don't do it. I, I, I don't. You, I don't look, I, here's, where, here's where I totally disagree. I think I'm going to use an example. Do you think I hear the, the power and the hunger in a young Gene Simmons when, when I first hear Deuce? When I hear... Burn, bitch, burn. I hear a guy goes, you know what? I got a song to write. They need four songs for this record. Eh, this is what we're going to do. And and I don't hear the hunger and the passion in something like Burn, Bitch, Burn. Actually, anything he did throughout the 80s. And, and that's I'll a good tell you point. When he did, that's on, that's a on. very good point. I'll, but I'll, I, but, I'll, I'll but, tell but. you when he did care again. When you listened to Unholy, he cared again. It meant something to him. And I think that's what I'm trying to say. He checked out in the 80s. He'll be the first to tell you he checked out in the 80s. And the the proof is in the pudding. I can't listen to the Gene Simmons songs on those records for the most part. They, they're just there's nothing to them. They, they were so written just to write a song because he had to get songs on the record. Whereas when I hear Unholy, I hear the fucking demon. I hear the same guy who said, get up and get your grandma out of here. That's yep. what I heard. And point taken, um, I think, but but again, it comes down to preference and, and opinions and perspective, and that's and that's how you hear it because um, I, I mentioned this in the book. When I, when I hear everything you just described about the way you described Gene's uh, lyrics and his attitudes on the uh, during the, on the '80s albums, that's the same way I hear Gene's songs on Rock and Roll Over. To me, Ladies' Room is very weak. Um, See You in Your Dreams is very weak. Love him, love him, and leave him. I sometimes wonder how did that song even make the album? It's just such a weird. It's just not a great song to me, but that. But again, it always comes. It comes down to my ears, my preference, and what I think, and that's it. I can't tell other Kiss fans this is how you should hear this or this is how you, you should interpret this. To me, um, and and I, and I mentioned this in the book. I used to think "Murder in High Heels" was the dumbest Kiss song ever. I was like, how do they? How did this even make the cutting board? This is such a dumb song. Now, as of 2017, it's my favorite song on the album. I love the I love the the kick drum on it. I love the hi hat. I love the the rhythm guitar on there, but. Whether another Kiss fan gets that or not, I really don't care. It's like I love this song to death. I got I got to play it. I played it like a million times last year in 2016 because I love it and this is what it does for me. But I can't fault Mark because Mark likes a certain song on this album or that album. That's what gets that's what Mark loves. That's what gets him off. That's what does it for him. Different things do different things for us. And you know, that's you know, it. I mean, you're, 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 you're 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 right about that because how many times we can all relate to this? You've listened to. And not just a Kiss song, just pick any song. You've heard of some song on the radio a million times over the last 30 years. And it was just a song. But all of a sudden, something happens in your life. Just 
in the last month, the last year, the last week, that all of a sudden, one of the lyrics in that same song now all of a sudden connects to you. And that same right. song that meant nothing for 30 years all of a sudden has deep meaning and a deep connection to you because now all of a sudden you get what the song was saying. And, and, and I'll add to that. Um, you know, you know, two songs I thought were just the dumbest songs in the world. Um, Blinded by the Light. I believe that's Manfred Man, if I'm correct. Is, Blinded yep. by the Light. Yes. And, um, and Tainted that's Love. Good. I don't know who sings that. But, um, well, didn't Tainted Bruce Springsteen love. write Blinded by the Light? I believe he wrote that song. I think he did a version of Man for Man did a second. But um but those two songs, Blinded by the Light and Take the Love, I thought they were just really dumb songs. I thought for years these were just dumb songs. And I would always turn the station. Now, when they come on the radio, I blast them. <laughs> something just clicked one day where I just I, you know you know you hate something so much you start to like it, and that's really what it was. I blast those songs, but um I think kiss music is no different. It really isn't. I mean um, I, I, you know, I, you know, I said what I said about Paul Stanley's solo album. Uh, I think it's a weak produced album. I think the sound is really muffled. But guess what? I love to listen to it, though. I really do. I mean, I think it's just a fun album to listen to. It's a fun album to sing along to. But um, I still think it's the weakest musically of the four. And I know right now a bunch of Kiss fans just clicked off and decided not to buy my book now. <laughs> 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 but but um, but but even though I think it's the weakest of the four, it's. My, it's my favorite to sing along to, definitely. And and it's just it's just honestly, there's no right or wrong when it comes to Kiss, and I can't make Kiss fans understand this enough. There's no right or wrong. It's just we like what we like. And who knows? Next week I might next week I might not even want to listen to no Animalize or Asylum. I might want to uh, where's my Love Gun at? I'm gonna bump some Love Gun for about a week. You know what I'm saying? I go through I go through different phases with Kiss albums, and um, that's it. There's no right or there's no right or wrong when it comes to Kiss songs. That's it. I mean. I mean, I think Sonic Boom is his ass. I could wipe my ass with that thing like toilet paper. <laughs> but I still love to listen to it, though. I, I, you know, I mean, I just I like to listen to it. To me, Paul dropped the ball dramatically on this album, but I love to listen to it. I, I think, I think it. Sonic Boom and Monster could have been great Kiss albums if somebody else produced them and brought them, brought them across the, the winning line. Made the album. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and um, and honestly, it's not. Paul's got a lot of great productions that I like. Um, I like what he did with Animal Eyes. I love what he did with Asylum. But to me, um, Paul is just not hungry no more. He's got no reason to be hungry. He's now in this legendary band that's made the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He's he's got millions upon millions. He's got his family thing he's doing. He's not hungry. He's not '80s Paul no more. '80s Paul recording Animal Eyes and you know, Lick It Up and Asylum. Paul had to steer that ship and just be hungry and just try to make something happen. You know. But he's just not hungry no more, and that's just that. So Paul just, you know, I think I think the problem with Paul is he needs to step out of the driver's seat and let someone else take the wheel. That's it. I agree. Um, when you read the when you read the the, the solo albums book, um, some that some that stuck out to me the most about Paul's album was how the producer said, um, the producer said, "What am I even here for?" Because Paul Paul is like calling all the shots, and he's not letting me guide or direct nothing. Paul wants to do everything. And um, Paul just might be in that mindset now. Um, maybe they want to save money on a producer. I don't know what, what the situation is, but Paul just needs to not produce no more Kiss albums and let someone else just steer the ship. My opinion, it doesn't mean it's written in stone. It's just my opinion. Well, I think, I think a lot of Kiss fans would say in the end, the majority of the best Kiss albums that they like have been produced by an outside producer. Right. And... um. And so be it. You know, um, here's, here's the thing with me and KISS fans. Again, I didn't grow up with KISS fans. You guys did. So sometimes I don't even know what to think about KISS fans when I'm around KISS fans. I don't know how to really relate to them or, you know, when, when I'm in a group setting like that. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I don't really care, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, I love KISS fans. Um, I like to share my stories with KISS fans. But at the same time, it's like if you don't get me, it's not a big deal. We can still go. You know, we can still go have lunch. We can still go drink a beer together. You know, we don't have to. Well, that that I I, get to... I I I get it. That that is to me. That's the attitude you should have. That's the attitude we've always had about our podcast. We don't. Yeah, you, I was going to say. Well, you just that's that's the reason you, this podcast exists. You don't, is, you don't. You can't sit and come and talk about Kiss or you know. You don't get our podcast. I don't. I don't care. You don't. You don't agree with what Mark said or Tommy said or I said. We we honestly really don't care. Uh, it's it's not important to us, and and you know I think you've got the right attitude. 
And I totally, I totally get why all these Kiss fans like different things because that's just who we are. I mean, Kiss has been on what four decades now, and God, they just got so many things to pick from from the Kiss menu. <laughs> and um, I'm not going to eat everything on the menu. I'm not. I'm just going to take what I want for that time, and you know, I'm going to pass on the rest. And, and next month I'll come back, and what I pass on, I'll pick that up. Now, you know, that's just it. You know, love Kiss for who they are, and everybody just have fun with it. I guess that's what I'm saying. Have fun with it, and let the next person have fun with what he wants to have fun with. And, I mean, when Kiss first started, we can all agree on this. It was a rock and roll band about living life and let's celebrate life, let's all have fun, and that's what it should always be. I don't get this war within Kiss, you know, Kiss fans. I don't get the personal war. I, I've never understood that. And um, they just sh- it shouldn't be that way. It's just this is not what the band started out to be. It's just it's a party band. It's a fun band. It's an exciting band, and let's just have fun with it. If you don't like that, I like I don't know. Just have fun with it. I guess I don't want to be redundant here, but just have fun with it is all I'm saying. Well, I would like to think, you know, just music in general. I mean, if you're if you're stressing out and 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 it's funny though too because this is where, where Michael and I, especially more so Michael in 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 the past to some degree, and it's something we've talked about privately and stuff, and we joke about Tommy and I do. The first sign of an argument, kiss wise, I'm gone. I'm like, right. kiss is supposed to bring me joy, whereas Mike just loves it. <laughs> I just love to put I just love to put those fans in their place and make them realize that oh, wow. you're not talking facts. I mean, everything we just talked about here with you, Anthony, none of it is factual. It's the three of us having our opinions about what we like. Right. And and you can you can berate me all you want for the next twelve hours. It won't change anything about what I think about rock and roll over. And I could tell Mark everything about Crazy Nights for the next three months. It won't change what he thinks. That's that. That's what fans don't get is you. There, there's nothing you can do to factually prove that something is a better album than this. A better guitar player, a better tour, a better musician. There's nothing because music is a hundred percent subjective, right? And and that's really it. That's all it comes down to: what, what you like and what you don't like. Um, you know, I'm, not really I'm, much, I'm not I'm but... not concerned with society approving what I like anymore. Let's put it this way: anymore. I'm sure back in junior high and high school, yeah, it bothered me that that fan, friends <clears throat> didn't like Kiss when I loved them. But now I don't care. I'm, not, you know, my life doesn't change if you don't think Crazy Nights is a great album, and my life doesn't change if I don't think Ace Frehley is a guitar god. <laughs> right, and that's that's about it in a nutshell. Um, you know what? Let me um, can I play your little game with you guys? I don't want to say little. That sounds sure. good. Can I play your game with you guys? Crank killing. Under- Crank kill and redo, right? Uh, under, 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 understand that Mark never plays by rules. <laughs> Ever. Ever. That's all right. Um, this is a... Who, who's on the phone right now? Is it just you two? It, it's just us. Yeah, just us. Tommy's okay, not okay. here. Okay, great. Okay. Um, and I wrote a couple of these down because I, I, I was kind of curious about your guys' perspective and opinions on these. All right, I got three of them for you. Okay, we'll do the first one. TV interviews. Um... These are just interviews. They're just talking, not the music, the musical appearance, just the, just the interviews. Um, Mike Douglas, Tom Snyder, Kids Are People Too. Crank, kill, or redo? I would say you got to crank Tom Snyder. Um, You know, the other two are tough for me because I I didn't experience those two as they happened. I only experienced the other two when I finally got, like, compilation tapes and I was able to watch them. And I think you lose something when you're just watching it as a part of a whole bunch of interviews. Right. Um, If I was to kill one... Kill kids or people, too. And and redo Mike Douglas. What would I redo on it? I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know what I would redo. But I couldn't kill the Mike Douglas just because it's in it 
in itself, that was a classic interview. Right. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you. I'm glad you chose that, Michael, because I'm. I'm different. Um, I would obviously crank the uh, the, the the Tom Snyder. That's just the best. Um, I would kill the Mike Douglas because I, I hated, always hated the way the concert part was filmed. It's there's like no close-ups of Peter. Uh, I did just, just and and I thought Gene made an ass out of himself. Yeah, it's Kiss folklore and everything, but for the game and keep in mind we're playing a game here. So I would, so I would ditch that one and I'd redo Kids Are People too with them playing at least one song live and. Having having the stage more kiss because when I, I remember when I because I watched that live I remember I, I begged my parents because we used to go to like twelve o'clock mass I'm Catholic we used to go to twelve o'clock mass and kids of people too I think started at like eleven thirty or something I like I said look I'm going to you know I'm going to early mass I want to make sure kiss is going to be on and uh, I used to walk to church because church was right down the street so I remember running home after mass. Watching Kids Are People too, which at 15 was a little, you know, my parents are like, you want to watch Kids Are People? What are you, nuts? And I'm like, Kiss is on. So, <laughs> right. And I remember going, I remember going, oh, man, really? That's it? And and I remember feeling like kind of weird that the, the kids, because who are younger than I was, were asking the questions. And the one kid get, gets asked, who's his favorite? And he says, Peter Chris. And, <laughs> and the, right. you know, and the announcer's like, I, I just, it was just kind of one of those wah wah kind of moments. So I would redo the Kids Are People too with a live kiss performance of one song in the studio and the set being more like, um, I don't know how geeky you are with this kind of stuff. Um, Anthony, do you remember what the 1980, excuse me, 1997. Australian interview um, when they got when they got there with oh, Peter. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, those remember chairs, that, the big, yeah, like, the big silver, correct. like tinfoilish type chairs. Yes, that, that was very much thrones, a kiss thrones. Yes, yeah, yeah. they're thrones. Right. And I would have, I would have liked to have seen that sort of thing in 1980. That, that's actually that's actually a real good perspective. What you said there about the kids and people too, as far as the. Uh make it more of a KISS setting, especially when they're introducing the new drummer. They could have had more of a theme with that. Um, I didn't even key in on that. I will say this, though. Um, you and me, were, we, were, we were tied on this one, Mark. Um, i definitely say crank Tom Snyder. Um, redo Kids Are People too. And what I would redo with that is I would uh, – I, I mean, I just wanted the interview to be a little bit more longer, especially with Eric, ask him a little bit more questions. And Mike Douglas – now, we're just doing interviews here. We're not talking about the live performances, just the interviews. But I would kill Mike Douglas because – um, even though it was a legendary, you know, um, in, you know, interview with Kiss and blah blah and Gene coming out the way he did, you really didn't. It wasn't really a Kiss thing. I mean, you didn't really. Gene didn't really get interview. You know, you asked a lot of questions, and it was mostly just Tootie Fields clowning him and blah blah blah. So, yeah, you and me are, are tied for that one, Mark. Definitely. Um, I think we have we have one more. I think we have time for one more. If you wanna, yeah. you got anything else? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, um, okay, these are TV performances. Just the performances now. Um, Midnight Special, Paul Lynn, Fridays. Hmm. Midnight Special, I, Paul I'll, Lynn, I'll, I'll start. Fridays. So, I got to crank Paul Lynn. That's the greatest, greatest TV appearance Kiss ever did. I mean, that was my, that was my orgasm moment for Kiss. Um. <sighs> redo I'd redo Fridays again I'm not quite sure what I want to redo but I was really getting deeply into my Kiss super fandom D it was kicking off with the Elder and that was I just remember my god they're going to be on I'm watching this show and I just remember intently just l not even paying attention to the music, but watching how do they perform in street shoes, basically. Right. It's like, you know, it's like, oh, my God, how's Gene going to move in shoes that aren't high boots? And Paul, and right. what's that like? And and I wanted to see, like, the backs of their outfits because now all of a sudden it's like, what does the back of, like, normal street clothes almost look like on them? Um, and, and the Midnight Special, I'd kill – 
again, it was just it was before my time. I never saw that one when it happened. It was one of those where I just saw it in a compilation reel years later. So it has it has no meaning to, for me. Right, right. Definitely. Well, it's it, it's obvious um, that we would crank the uh, what was it the midnight special? Is that what the right yeah, midnight that, special? That, oh, that is that. That's it, man. Uh, that that that's the zenith for me. They were young, hungry, kicking ass. I love that. Um, I would. Get rid of um, Paul Lynn because I always hated the oh. edits. Oh. Um, and Fridays, it's not so much that I would, you know, let me say something because Fridays I would have liked to have seen, um, you know, uh, to redo. I'd like them to use the mysterious eye video shoot background. Um, I would have liked to have seen again the stage more, more, more of a kiss show. Yes, I'd, I would have liked to have seen those three songs done more on our actual kiss stage than, than that. So, um, we would, uh, obviously crank, uh, the midnight special and we'd probably just sit there and watch it over and over and over until we got around to anything else and, uh, redo Fridays and, uh, Paul in the edits, edits bugged me. I'm going to say, um, I would crank Fridays because it was a unique time. You really didn't get to see the elder kiss performing those, performing those older songs back in that era live. So um, I'm definitely going to say um, Crank Fridays. Um, I'm going to kill Paul Lynn. Oh, jeez. Because um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Mike's, <laughs> Mike's over the trip. Don't, don't bother, Mike. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to kill Paul Lynn, and I'm going to say redo Midnight Special. And when I'm going to say redo, just because it was a TV appearance, um, I would I would rather have him do different songs. Well, do a, do do a couple of different songs than what they did, so that'd be it. Um, I got one more, and I want and this is kind of this was actually kind of targeted towards Mike and Tommy, but um, Mark can answer on trickier. behalf of Tommy. All right, <laughs> where's my glasses? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now I, I specifically picked this one based on you know what Mark says about the albums, the 70, 70s albums and everything. So I'm kind of curious about, and no, I'm not trying to put you on the spot or not like that. I'm just kind of curious about how you would break this down. Okay, one of these is a solo album, one is a studio album, and the other one is a live album. So here we go: Paul solo album, Rock and Roll Over, Alive. So crank, kill, redo. Paul solo album, rock and roll over, and alive. Um, I would crank rock and roll over. I would kill alive, and I'd redo Paul's solo album. I'd probably make Paul's solo album just a bit heavier. That actually okay. wasn't that hard for me. It wasn't hard. I mean, it was easy. It's e. It's easy for me to kill alive. <laughs> okay, I know Mark wants to think on this a little bit, so I'm gonna go ahead and just answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna say crank. I'm gonna say crank alive. Kill rock and roll over. That was kind of obvious. And redo redo Paul's solo album. And what I would redo a Paul's solo album is just make it heavier, more more rock, more uh, all American man and uh, take me and do you love me and things like that. I'd rather have on there. All right, all right, Anthony, you need this visual. Mike's Mike, can you see what I'm doing? Yeah, my hands up. Middle, no, 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 no. We're cranking alive. We're cranking okay. rock and roll over, and we're cranking Paul's solo album. Drops the mic. See, remember, I told you, Mark <laughs> plays by his own rules. <laughs> you cannot change any of those. You cannot speak ill of any of those. Those three are three of the greatest moments of Kiss music. All three are to be cranked. And nothing is, and you're not allowed to touch them. Now, if I was Next. to answer on behalf of Tommy, I'm guessing Tommy would crank alive, because Tommy will, first of all, play by the rules, not like Mark. <laughs> so Tommy would crank alive. Right. Um, would he kill, Mark, do you think Tommy would kill Paul's solo album and redo Rock and Roll Over? Yeah, I think. I, yeah. You know, it's hard. It's, it's hard to... to... That that's really all joking aside. That, that's a tough. That's brief a tough one. I, I, I'm I'm passionately. And I specifically po I specifically picked this one out just for Tommy and Mark the way that I've heard them talk about these albums. So, um, 
Yeah, you know, you know what's great about yeah, Mark's yeah, answer? Yeah. When, when, when Anthony, if you would have replaced Alive with Alive 2, that wouldn't have been nearly as easy for me to do. That, that would have been too easy. That would have been too And I know that for you guys, that would have been too that easy, especially been, for Tommy and Mark. That would have been a hard one for me. <laughs> but let me say this. You know what's great about Mark's answer about cranking all three of them? Um, I love it because that's just how he feels about it, <laughs> period. Yeah, He loves those albums, and he's going to defend those best. albums to himself, and that's it. There's no rules in Kiss. Great. Mark plays by no, no rules. Exactly. <laughs> That's pretty funny. And Anthony, we have been talking for nearly two hours here. This has been freaking awesome. It's like talking to Definitely. a real, it's like talking to a real Kiss fan because you are. <laughs> um, where can people buy your book? They can buy it at uh, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, pretty much wherever books are sold. It's a uh, order on demand. So that basically just means that. Well, actually, you can um, order an ebook too off Amazon. And um, yeah, you just just go on there, an ebook. Uh, if, if you want a car, uh, soft cover, which is what Elsa sold it, you just order it, and um, they'll send and, you a copy and, in the mail. And, so. and just everybody know it's all text. There's no photos in here. Right, it's no called, photos in there. They, they wouldn't allow it. Kiss my black ass. This is my black kiss story, and the author is Anthony X. Definitely. And I want and I want you guys to know. Um, and you know, we'll tell you we don't think so. What a great read. What a great, you'll have so much. I did not, um, as soon as it ended, I was like, damn, I mean, I ripped right through that book. I loved it. And again, like I said, you know, when, when I, when we got our books, I sent something to Mike and Tommy. I'm like, you, you guys start this shit. This is fucking awesome. So I, I know you guys are going to have the same experience. Please go buy the book, su- support Anthony. Um, excellent book. Yeah. A lot of fun. And I tell you what, totally different than, and this is the cool part. Totally different than any other Kiss book. You, there's not one page of this book where you'll be going, I "Already read that," or this. Yeah, no, e- e- this exactly. Is unlike exactly. Any other Kiss experience. This, this is this is not about Kiss facts, Kiss history, who recorded what, who drew what. This has nothing to do with any of that. This, and this is why every single Kiss fan can relate to this book. This book is about being a Kiss fan. It's about how you feel when you go to get an album, how you feel when you went to your first concert, buying tickets. It's it's all those feelings that every single KISS fan has. And Anthony just recapped all of it. Might be different events, but you're going to identify. Trust me, you will, I, you will identify with so many things where Anthony wrote down here. You're going to be like, oh, God, yeah, I remember feeling that way about this. It's it was just it was such a, a connection. Yeah, I really appreciate that guy. Really appreciate that you guys and just hearing hearing that from you guys just really means a lot to me. And um, yeah, appreciate it. And I love I love the show. And just keep doing what you're doing. And um, hey, well, listen, yeah, I want I want to give you a little shout out for mentioning us. Oh, that's right, he did. And, I, that's right. Begin, early on in the book, you gave a quick little shout out how basically you know you want what well, you wanted to to. Re- do some recordings or something, but then. No, we were going to do our own. My brother and me, we were going to do our own little podcast show. And um, I told uh, my brother, um, I, well, actually, we found out there was a show called Three Sides of the Coin. And we both agreed that you guys were doing a great job. And I didn't think we could we could compete with what you guys were doing. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to write a book. It, wor- <laughs> so, it, wor- it worked out for the best because we ended up with an awesome book here. Definitely, and also, you know, yes. and, and with an awesome show. So, and like I told Mark the first time I talked to him, if it hadn't been for you guys, there probably wouldn't have been a book. So, appreciate it. And um, yeah, like I said, you guys got a great show, and just keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, I look forward to every episode. And um, you know, you guys are awesome. If, if you guys, uh, where 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 can can people can fans and listeners find you online? Do you want to hear from fans on Facebook? Oh, definitely, or sure, website? um, definitely. Um, you can find me on Facebook. Um. Um, Anthony Stanley is where you can find me under on Facebook. Anthony Stanley. Okay. So, I mean, if you get the book and you read it, let them know you heard them on uh, on three sides. Let them know what you think of the book. You know, spread the love. This is a great book. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, again, I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys. I really do. I appreciate it. Cool. Anthony, thanks so much for taking a couple hours out of your out of your kiss life and sharing your stories with us here this was this was it was awesome this is this is exactly like the kind of discussion you would have at a kiss expo sitting in the lobby or sitting in the bar when you just sit down with another kiss fan you just start telling these stories like this 
And, and, and two things. You're, you're welcome back anytime. And I remember at the end of the book, you said you, you want to do a part two. So uh, get busy, my friend. You got, uh, <laughs> we, uh, you know, we'll, we're here to support you. I appreciate it, guys. Definitely. And, um, you guys have a good night. And um, definitely, well, we'll be talking to you soon. Take care, cool, Anthony. Man. Bye. All right. Bye bye. Take three sides of the coin with you anywhere. Download your five-star rated free smartphone app today and listen on your Android or Apple smartphone. Visit android.threesidesofthecoin.com or ios.threesidesofthecoin.com. That was just such a, I don't know, it just, I said it on when we had Anthony on. It was just like sitting there talking to a Kiss fan. It was just so cool. It was just like somebody who we could all relate to. I, I want to relate this conversation very much so how it is on the Kiss Cruise. People you've never met, where you just sit and you start talking Kiss, and next thing you're like, hey, the sun's coming up. I mean, it, it, it was really that organic. And, and, and I tell you what, everything that just happened in, in, in this conversation we just had is exactly what I was hoping for and thought would happen when I got a hold of Mike and Tommy after I started the book going, we got to have this guy on. I mean, it was apparent from the beginning I loved his, again, guys, picture yourself being in the in a town where there's really no other kids fans. You're in a state, you know, up in Alaska where you don't have the, the readiness. Now, look, I know a lot of, I, because we hear from you guys too, Michael, Tommy, and I, we hear all the time in our through our IMs and everything that, you know what, there, I don't have any KISS friends or anybody that, or I live in a smaller town. Whereas Michael, Tommy, and I, that's not our perspective. You guys grew up in Minneapolis. I grew up in Detroit. Kiss was everywhere. You know, I never stopped to take the time to go, what if I did live up in Alaska? Would my passion be what it is now? Is my passion because they were here everywhere in Detroit? I mean, this is a guy who had to work to be a Kiss fan. He'd freaking walk through snow to go get yeah. a Kiss album. And that's a story he didn't tell him. I want. Do you remember the story where he walked like you know whatever like froze his butt miles. off. Miles. Yes. And again, this is another reason to read this book. Um, we didn't even scratch the surface. There's so many chapters in there. You're going to end with a big smile on your face because it's. You're and just, it's not. You're, you're just going to go. Listen, I didn't walk through snow, but man, I have my story of what I did to go get a right. kiss, whatever the kiss action figure, a kiss ticket, go to a show. We've all got these stories. And like I said at the very beginning, this is the first time a book has been written to tell the story of a KISS fan, not of KISS. This isn't the story of KISS. This is of a fan of the band. And again, it's not a story of, hey, again, I'll use my sister as an example. I'm from Detroit. KISS was everywhere. I love KISS. No, man. This is totally, this is. This is from such a, I think most people would find his unique perspective because he didn't grow up a place where Kiss played there all the time. And there was Kiss, you know, ever, that's not what it was like for him. And, and to, to have to, to have that passion and to never let it go to this day, that says a lot about not only the book, but, but about Anthony as a human being, you know what I mean? He found something that he loved and he stuck with it much like I think everybody here in my voice. That's why we're here. We're Kiss fans. Three sides of the coin, Kiss fan. Yep, that's what that's what we're here for, man. And and what a, a pleasure it is when I think you know, instead of having some record executive on this week, having somebody I'd I'd like to, to I'd like to think the euphoria that I know Michael and I feel right now after after having that great interview. I hope you guys have that same feeling too after the the conversation we just had. Yeah, so I'm feeling I, really good, man. I, I am. I'm. I. I was so happy when I read the book. I was so happy when we got him confirmed, and now the interview's done. It was just. It's just. It's fun talking to somebody like that. It's fun talking to somebody who has is it Tommy? This, <laughs> that isn't Tommy exactly. Somebody that has had the same feelings you have had about the band. That I mean, that's at the end of the day. It's just like our. I can totally relate to him. Totally relate to him. So go yep. out and get the book. Yes. It's 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 a fun read. It's an easy read. You're not going to agree with everything, but don't get mad. Neither did uh, I. I, I mean, when he first started writing about rock and roll over, I was like, oh, my God, I hate this guy. 
know, how can you hate rock and roll over? But but then you're going to find things where you do agree, and you're going to have this. It's just it's well worth it. It's well worth it. Um, homework for this week. Um, I don't know. Why don't you, if if you've read the book, share your feelings, what you thought about the book. But if you haven't read the book, why don't you share one of your crazy kiss stories? What have you done to go get an album, to go get tickets, to go to a show, to buy that T-shirt? Uh, what have you had? What you know? What what Indiana Jones type adventures have you gone through for Kiss? Because we've yeah. all got them. We've all got them. Mm-hmm. Lord knows that. Yeah. So yeah, share those stories. Facebook.com slash Three Sides of the Coin. Three Sides of the Coin dot com. YouTube, Spreaker, SoundCloud. We're everywhere. Let us know what you think. And next week. Hmm fingers are all crossed that that we get a a reconfirmation but next week's special guest a huge 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 bigly bigly guest all right that's it guys we're out of your three sides of the coin next week <laughs> Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and Shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. For interviews and media inquiries, contact Izzy at izzypresleyproductions.com. Download your free, free copy of the KISS School of Marketing. 11 Lessons I Learned Working with KISS. The number one downloaded business book on Noise Trade. Go to books.noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Love the show. Go to iTunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.